festivals that are going on now to their nation and also to, um, to the arts. Uh, my name is Frank Lenschko. I am from the Siegel Theatre Centre. We bridge academia and professional theatre, international and American theatre, but I care very much about the impact of the art, the importance, and about socially engaged uh, uh, art. Um, we hope you all have the program, so you will see the lineup of uh, what uh, we are doing uh, here. This goes uh, till uh, 1 or 1 30 in this room. The presentation, then we will go for lunch to the Siegel Theatre Centre across uh, the, uh, the hall for working groups. If you care and would like to join, please do sign up uh, for the work with the Siegel, uh, with the Theatre Without Borders, and uh, to um, stay in contact with uh, what we do. If you have a cell phone, uh, this is the moment, take it out, and I'll do the same. Chat if it's uh, says, uh, ringer, uh, on silent again. Thank you all uh, for coming. This event is free and open uh, to the public, and I think it's a great honor for us to have uh, be without borders with us and all the speakers and all. So to you, thank you for coming. We know uh, how busy you all are. There's so much going on in town, and we really appreciate that you took time out of your life to say this is an important uh, uh, a moment. This is an important subject. So for coming. So thank you, and I hand over to Jessica. Matthew and David, and uh, here we go. Okay, are we going to talk into here? Yes. Okay, that sounds good. All right, welcome, and we're so happy to have you here. A lot of people will be filtering in our speakers. A lot of them are not here yet, and. Um, Neither is Berta Levitan, who I'll speak about in a moment. It's crazy out there on the subways today, we know. So we want to welcome you. We're so happy. I'm, I'm working off these little things that I wrote, so forgive me. I'm trying to be spontaneous, but I, wanna, I haven't had enough coffee to be truly spontaneous. Um, Theatre Without Borders is about using radical international hospitality to make connections across borders with artists worldwide. We are a large group of thoughtful practitioners whose heartfelt purpose is to celebrate humanity through the art of theater and the act of connection in the spirit of inclusivity and freedom. Now, I'm going to talk about Roberta, who's not here yet, sadly, but she will be. Um, thanks to the hard work of our founder and director, Roberta Levitow, we keep thriving and growing as a 100% volunteer network of um, artists and professional artists whose, you know, whose mission and purpose is to uh, work with connectivity and, uh, and do the art of theater. Um, we depend on the kindness of friends like Frank and CUNY, who we collaborated with last on our Global Mobility Symposium. Some of you were here for that. Um, David and I have been core members for many years, as have others in this room. Katrine is one of the co-founders. Um, can anybody wave if you're a Theatre Without Borders member? So we know, yay, there are people all over the room. Um, and uh, also, we want to thank all the people who are watching from afar, like the co-director, Daniel Banks, uh, and people, all our friends who are watching around the world, thanks to our other dear, dear friends at HowlRound, who share our love of global connectivity. Check out the World Theater Map on the HowlRound site, add your name to it, and join Theater Without Borders to keep the movement going and the dream of global theatrical connectivity alive. Um, I'm Jessica Litwak. I'm a playwright, actor, director, drama therapist, activist, puppet maker, and scholar. <laughs> I put all of those tools together in my company, The Heat Collective, which is also one of the organizers of this event. Heat stands for Healing, Education, Activism, and Theater. Um, and in the spirit of courageous generosity, we make art that serves. Through workshops, community events, performances, and theater actions, we work to build creative community that uses theater to inspire positive personal, personal and social change. You'll hear more about projects later. We're thrilled to join with Theater Without Borders and the Martin Siegel Center to host this day. So I just want to tell you, you're going to hear lots and lots and lots of people talking, and we're going to talk at, not at you, but with you, 
uh, for a long time. Uh, and then you'll get a chance to talk back to and at and with us. So there will be a discussion at the end and a networking lunch that Matthew will talk about a little bit more. But I just want you to know that the, the first presentations are going to be a listening tool that you will then hopefully be inspired to, um, to talk about later when, when we open the discussion up. So I'm going to turn it over to David. Hi everybody, so happy to welcome everybody. I just want, uh, Roberta Leventhal just walked in. You were mentioned earlier, I want people to know who you are, the founder, one of the founders of Theater Without Borders. Welcome. Um, I'm, uh, I work with La Mama Experimental Theater Club, La Mama Umbria International, the Barrow Group Theater Company here in New York, and companies uh, creative arts leadership and career coaching for artists, among other things, as we all do wear many hats in this field. Mm -hmm. And so I, one of the things I've been working on lately is the Ellen Stewart International Award, which gives a, a, an award for an artist or an arts group that works with young people in social change, in the area of social change. So in this, I was a, just stunned, really, by how many nominations came through in this round of the Ellen Stewart Awards from and seeing the extraordinary work that artists are doing from Armenia to South Africa, Trinidad and Tobago, Palestine, Israel, um, countries and cities large and small, artists are creating theater to fight oppression, to bring truth where it's often blurred, to share a common humanity that overrides our differences of age, race, ability, sexuality, to engage in a conversation that rises above denigration and leads to justice, equality, kindness, and peace. This is our opportunity to push our own practice to the limits, to create an enormous community that decries hate and celebrates free expression of our deepest selves. So during this day, I encourage you to take the examples you will see here today, mix in your own thought, perspective, and ideas, channel through your own artistic practice. You, each of you, is a leader for change, and we so need your voice right now but know that there is a sea of support all around you waiting to take part, to engage, to listen, and to help. We are each other's support. After um, the initial section of the, of the morning, as you'll see in your program, uh, of uh, reports of what people are doing now, the second part is going to be an artistic conversation. A group of artists who work here with us, engaged in theater and resistance, will share their work with us but also question each other about our common struggles and how we can successfully navigate our challenges. Today, I think, is a lot about learning from each other, getting to know each other, and sharing um, the best practices that we know. So welcome and enjoy the day. Here is Matthew. <laughs> um, very briefly, I'm Matthew Covey. I'm an immigration attorney, and I am the director of Thomas Dot, which is a arts mobility advocacy organization. Uh, over the last 20 years, we have really honed in on the topic of arts mobility because the, the, the basic idea is that communication is at the core of empathy, and empathy is at the core of civil society, and the arts are uniquely positioned to create communication, especially across borders, but if you can't get the artists across the borders, then you can't have that whole process happen. So, we focus on uh, artist mobility, U.S. immigration issues, and that kind of thing. So teaming up with these folks and with uh, Artists Without Borders, or Theater Across Borders Without Borders, makes a ton of sense because it all kind of goes across borders. Um, so today, as my colleagues have alluded, there's going to be a, a sort of an arc of conversation starting by uh, a bunch of case examples of really interesting projects from around the world of theater organizations pushing boundaries, stretching limits, and resisting it back against the powers that are uh, affecting them in their own context. From that, we move to a conversation with a group of artists talking about the challenges that they're facing uh, and the successes that they're having. The third chunk is going to be a th three sessions, short sessions, where people are, where um, people, members of the community who are really invested in specific topics uh, going to be kind of doing a really abrupt download of best practices and how they see the, pr 
project of resistance and the praxis of resistance affecting the work that they do from a couple of different specific angles in regards to specific topics. So that's the kind of like unilateral, we're pouring ideas onto you. That then moves to an open conversation, which goes on for about 45 minutes, something like that, where we're really wanting people to take all the stuff they've just been hearing and all the stuff they do in their lives and throw it all together and really uh, kind of dive into the issues that we're all struggling with. That leads to the lunch, for any of you who can stay for lunch, um, where the idea is to break up into groups by your interests and kind of pursue those conversations that we just had as a group, individually and in smaller groups so we can kind of go a little bit deeper. Uh, that's the arc. Uh, hope it works, and hopefully <laughs> it will remain interesting. We are working on getting the room a little cooler because it's pretty hot in here. Um, so that's in process. Uh, anyway, mostly thank you all for coming, and uh, really, really looking forward to what we're all going to get done today. Okay, um, can Nisha come on down? We're all the, um, I'll just invite the speakers to come sit in the front row to, to save time. Here comes Saviana and Nisha. Um, Nisha needs her name tag when you get a chance. Okay, thank you. So what we're going to go into next is, uh, is a series of case studies. Some people will be in the room and some people will be far, far away um, to save us those uh, precious moments of Skype frustration. We have just asked for videos so we don't have to worry about um, internet problems. And uh, so it'll go back and forth. David and I will be introducing people and um, it'll be really quick. This is not deep, this is broad. So we'll be, uh, you'll be getting little bits three minutes or so from each organization. And I'm gonna start by inviting Sue Hamilton up on stage um, and talking a little bit about the Artists Rise Up movement that Sue and I started the day after the 2016 presidential election. We, Sue is, is in Los Angeles and I'm here in New York and we've been colleagues for many years and we got on the phone and said, what do we say? <laughs> and we decided to um, to start a, a bi-coastal uh, movement, or you know, not, it wasn't, it wasn't, we weren't beginning the movement, but we were calling it specifically Artists Rise Up New York and Artists Rise Up LA. Um, we had we were first on the phone with someone who had a much nastier name for the organization. One word began with. F and the second with T. And um, <laughs> we were like, no, no, man, we gotta be loving and creative. So uh, we started this Artist Rise Up New York and LA. It, it originally was in some other cities, but I think we've, we've been going strong. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Artist Rise Up New York, then Sue's gonna talk about Artist Rise Up LA and show a video of their work. You're about to hear about how this idea unfolded in two very different ways on two very different coasts. <laughs> so, um, anything you want to say about our our original idea? Or? It was brilliant. <laughs> yeah. It, it'll, yeah, it was. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Artists Rise Up New York, and before I do, is anyone Artists Rise Up New York people in the room? Yay! So I think some more are coming, but uh, they're running late. Uh, so the way we have manifested is very different from Artists Rise Up LA, which you'll see. Um, again, I got my little notes. Uh, it, it started at my house, and people just came to my house. We had like 30 people coming to the house, and people would either scream, cry, or talk. Some people wept and said, you know, you talk about breaking up a country, what about breaking up a family? And people were afraid to go home for Thanksgiving because their families had voted a different way than them. So we had this kind of very personal uh, catharsis where people were able to talk. Then we had some people who, who were really ready to scream. Uh, Joan Lipkin, who I, uh, is not here today, had the idea of having a rage cafe where we just went into a room and, and uh, threw things at the wall. And um, because 
Artists Rise Up New York, which is based on the same uh, philosophy as Theatre Without Borders, 100% uh, volunteer, rhizometric, collective volunteerism, and we depend on the kindness of people like Mia and La Mama and, um, and our friends at the LARC, we didn't feel it was right to throw things. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're welcome, Mia. So we uh, created an evening called The Rising uh, uh, just about a year ago at, at La Mama that included um, all of our all of our events include a blessing by Ryan um, Little Eagle Pierce, who's from the Eagle Project, and really acknowledging the land that we're standing on, which is Lenape land here in, in Manhattan. And we uh, also do these installations, okay? And we and we perform some pieces. We then did. I'm just going to wrap up. We just did uh, for Women's History Month. We did Emma Goldman Day and Feminist Flash Mob also at La Mama. Then we made uh, puppets for the Science March, uh, Endangered Species puppets. We uh, collaborated with the LARC on the Climate Change Theater Action Landing, and then we are having a performance on the 29th, again at La Mama, at Great Gem Studio, called The Divide, which just talks about um, what's going on now, a year later, a year after the inauguration, theatrically and uh, artistically, and it's completely free, and all are welcome. So um, you can check out our website, artistrice.newyork.org, and here is Sue. Okay. Sue has often directed me, so I can stand here. Good morning, everyone. It is a, a true pleasure to be here this morning. Um, Jessica invited me to call in from Los Angeles, and uh, I said, oh, I'd rather show up. Um, so I'm really uh, excited to be here, and one of our producers from Artist Rise Up Los Angeles, Jose, is there behind uh, the camera. So again, uh, thank you so much for having us. So November 9th, 2016, Artist Rise Up Los Angeles and Artist Rise Up New York were born, and it was immediate, it was charged, it was almost effortless, and when Jessica and I came together on the phone, it wasn't, how are we going to do this? The question was, when are we starting? And the answer was, now, right? So uh, in Los Angeles, I put out a call on Facebook uh, and said, will you please come rise up with us? Uh, the Lyric Hyperion Theater in Silver Lake, California, if any of you have been there, it seats about 30 people. Uh, we had three times um, that amount that showed up, so that was invigorating and it was charged. And the question that I kept hearing was, what can I do? All these actors, directors, producers, writers, everybody coming together to say, what can I do, how can I help? And the answer I had was, well, we have to rise up and the way we're going to do that is to A, come together, which we had done, and B, what now are we going to do? So uh, here's what we've done over the past year. We did two big, live, all original shows in response to the election and its results. Uh, one big show at the El Portal, 400 seats, sold out, cover of the LA Times. Not to brag, but I was floored. And I was floored that people were just coming out and they were saying, we need to be here, we need to gather, we need to be together, we need to rise up. The next show was an all comedy, all music night with Trey Crowder and Mona Shake, many people who are making waves in the community, uh, also sold out. And then, because we're all, always evolving, uh, we did a film festival. Uh, at the Downtown Independent in Los Angeles just a couple of months ago, and all original films, all politically inspired. I share all of this with you today because we're proud. We're proud of what we're doing, and we are proud to be able to take all of our proceeds and get, give them to a charity of our choice. So to date, we have given uh, gifts to seven charities, including HRC, ACLU, uh, Planned Parenthood, and Southern Poverty Law Center. We know we have a lot of work to do, 
We're going into year two. We have a lot of work to do. And our energy is here. It's ready. Nobody is dropping off. People are saying, what can we do? How can we continue to galvanize? So we have a new space. We moved to the Atwater Village uh, Theater Festival in Atwater Village, and we're really excited to keep things going. So again, thank you so much for uh, letting me be here today, for welcoming us, and uh, we wanted to show you a very quick one-minute video of a question that we posed to two of our members, to Trey Crowder, the liberal redneck, and Mona Shake. So we're gonna show you that video now. Thank you again so much. Thank you, that is not what I told you it would be, but wasn't it lovely? <laughs> Was activism an art man to me? Uh, I just want to say now we're going to move kind of quickly through, um, through lots of case studies, so buckle up. I first met Isen Yafaga in Santa Fe, New Mexico a few years ago and was struck by his disarming manner and keen intelligence and brilliant artistry. Over the years, we developed a friendship that consistently inspires me. He's a multimedia artist and global community organizer from Cameroon with a fascinating story of resistance, incarceration, resilience, and deep service to the community. Here's Isenia Faga. shot this on my iPhone in Santa Fe, so fingers crossed. Hello, my name is Isenia Faga. I am a global community organizer, a political cartoonist, and uh, an activist. And lately, I am a radio producer. So I came from Cameroon. Uh, Cameroon is in West Africa. And so uh, some 24 years ago, uh, we started publishing cartoons in a newspaper because uh, in 1990s, over 60% of the population of Cameroon could not read fluently, they was illiterate. So we published this newspaper only by cartoons. All the information was cartoons so people can access education and information. So, and then my government established a censorship law to ban cartoons and information and free information. So we have to fight back that law. So I had to go to prison with some of my friends, and then we was in prison, and then we was tortured. So I was the luckiest one. I find myself in Paris for 10 years in exile. So in exile in Paris, because it wasn't a society designed for me, I was very depressed. So to find a way you know, to be depressed and find a therapy, I find it into art. So I started painting myself, because I came from a tribal community where people paint themselves. So that's how I find the therapy by painting myself. So I included music into my performances because when I was in prison, I listened to the music a lot. So I translate sometimes the, the canvas that I'm painting, I 
translate the song that I hear onto the canvas so you can actually see the song that you are listening to during the performance. I also paint cartoons very large and then the focus of my work is to inspire, move and also make people take action. This is how I change my, my art into the power of changing the world. And the reason why I am doing this kick ass project was the craziest project I've ever done in my life is to implant a radio station in the middle of nowhere in the jungle is because people need free information. Until then, they only rely on government information, meaning it's brainwash and it's propaganda. So people needed to broadcast a radio station for their own community and buy on their own community. So this radio station is solar powered in 10 languages and a way of break in the middle of the jungle. Concerning starting a crazy project, any idea that you have, normal people don't change the world. Only crazy people change the world. <laughs> so if any of you have a crazy idea, you just have to believe in it. And woke up in the morning and just trust that this project is the crazy idea you have and gather your friend to support. This is how I ended up hosting an event in my friend's house, turning the house into studios to raise funds or raise money in Kickstarter so that I can have this radio happening right now. So we've been broadcasting for the last four months and it's working perfectly. So if you have one crazy idea, get on it. And I wish you luck. Thank you. So um, Issa wanted to make sure because he didn't give you his website in this quick video and you didn't get to see his beautiful work. So um, uh, Matthew, where can people find the links to the websites? To uh, it's uh, thomas.org uh, thomas thomas slash theater and resistance and you can... Yes, and we can put it on the CUNY website as well, so you can really check out Issa's work. It's Say brilliant. It Pardon me? Say it slowly. We're going to put it on the CUNY, the CUNY website. We're going to put it on the CUNY website, so you'll be able to see it there. Okay? Do you want, you want the address of the website? Okay, so you'll find it. We'll tell you about it. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Diana Milosevic, artistic director of Da Theater in Belgrade, Serbia, started her theater over 25 years ago during the revolution in Yugoslavia, performing with an all-female collective in the streets of Belgrade. Da Teater is the only professional experimental theater group in Serbia and continues to shed light on the effects of violence and war, treatment of women in society, and social justice for all members of the society. I have the great pleasure of spending time with Diana and her company uh, during a Fulbright I did in Belgrade, and I'm very proud to uh, share with you Diana Milosevic. Hello to all wonderful friends from Theater Without Borders. Uh, I hope that your year started very well. Uh, here I am standing uh, at that theater in front of our new wall. It's the wall of the shining bricks. And some of you uh, helped us to uh, build our space that is still in becoming, but your names are with us every day, so thank you. Theater and resistance. So this is something that uh, maybe uh, I practiced with my theater for all 26 years and so that we exist. And for me, uh, this is not only the topics we are dealing with, because obviously from the very beginning we are dealing with anti-war topics, anti-violence and so on. It is also the way how we try to practice our life in the theater. And when it comes to that, this is the real challenge, how to resist uh, through the, not only, as I said, uh, our performances, but also how we communicate between ourselves, how we uh, communicate with the world, what do we accept, what do we don't accept, and so on and so on. So I think today that the um, uh, artistic groups and collectives are maybe more important than ever, because they are kind of the 
islands of light uh, and uh, that have a chance to um, operate within the cracks, as my favorite poet and uh, uh, musician Leonard Cohen uh, said, like there is the crack in everything, this is how the light gets in. I think this is where we should exist, like within the cracks of, uh, of the systems, of society, of cliches and trying to really um, shine out from there. And uh, Howard Zinn actually uh, said something that really speaks to me, and this is that the role of the artist uh, is to be rupture, so that we are basically, uh, we make ruptures. We are trying to make disorder in the order that is uh, basically very totalitarian in all our countries today. And this is where I see the main role of the theater and uh, its relation to resistance. Uh, yes, uh, we are. Yes, yes, theater. Okay, I'm going to keep over here. Yes, theater is a theater that I've worked with in Hebron, West Bank, and occupied Palestine. Uh, they are a company that is dedicated to communication among youth. A Palestinian NGO established in 2008. Yes, theater. Yes, theater can positively influence the children and youth to create a change in their society. Through its performances inside and outside Palestine, Yes, theater sheds light on the social problems in Palestinian society. I spent a lot of time there teaching puppet building and theater and drama therapy and was so deeply moved and impressed by their talent, their commitment to resistance, and their courage. So here is Yes Theater. Good morning from Yes Theater, good morning from Palestine. Actually, before that I introduce Yes Theater, I would like to tell you about my country, Palestine, which has more than 5,000 years of history. And this is a lot in comparison with a lot of emerging and powerful states. In the S theater, we are trying to improve the psychosocial well-being of Palestinian children and to empower rights holders to know about and clean their rights. This is done through the use of drama and theater. We have different techniques, we have different methodologies, and we have different interventions as well. During the last 10 years, the S theater has been able to reach more than 500,000 Palestinians. And what we are trying to do is not to provide the Palestinian people with an emergency, or uh, a humanitarian uh, activities. We are trying to support the Palestinian people during their struggle through providing them with different tools that could help them to cope with the situation and face their challenges. I hope that you can visit us in Palestine and support the Palestinian people, and I wish you a very fruitful conference, and I hope that we will get in touch with you soon. <laughs> That was Mohammed. We um, we don't have time to show the video of their actual work, but again, look up Yes Theater. They do amazing work with youth throughout Palestine. Thank you. Katie Rubin, executive director of Theater of the Oppressed New York City, is a joker, actor, and circus artist. She has facilitated and directed forum and legislative theater workshops and performances in partnership with various communities, including homeless adults and youth, LGBTQ homeless teens, people living with HIV AIDS, recent immigrants, and court-involved youth and adults. I've studied theater the oppressed with Katie and her company and become a huge fan of theirs. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to introduce Katie Rubin. Here. So, um, Theater of the Oppressed, uh, NYC, and Theater of the Oppressed as a, as a practice, of course, comes from uh, Brazil and Augusto Boal, and it's all about uh, participation and not just talking. 
Uh, so we're going to, I'm going to resist that uh, structure and we're going to warm up together. Uh, so uh, we do warm ups before all our plays because we don't believe that there are actors and spectators. We believe that everyone is a spect actor getting ready to take action in our own lives. So I'm going to sing a little song. You're going to sing back to me the opposite. Okay, it goes like this. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. No, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, no, yes. Yes, no, yes, no. All right, that's good. Uh, <laughs> up, down, up. Up, down, down. Down, up. Up, up, down. Up, down, no. Down, yes. Up, no, yes. Down, yes. All right, all right. It's still, it's still too easy, so let's say the opposite of red is blue, which is sometimes true. So uh, red, blue, red. Blue, red, blue. Blue, blue, down. Red, red, down. Down, yes, blue. So, um, if you're feeling a little bit confused, yeah, that's great. That's how we believe we need to be in order to make a change, in order to make things different than the way they were before. Um, so, Theater Depressed NYC partners, as David said, with community organizations, city agencies, uh, neighborhood groups, um, people experiencing oppression based on race, class, gender, sexual orientation. And uh, we build plays, form theater plays, based on the lived experiences of those communities. So Housing Works here in New York City, the Ali Fournay Center, Fortune Society, and many other groups. And perform those plays for free, always free, in front of all kinds of New Yorkers in all five boroughs, and then engage in forum theater, uh, where the audience is invited to come up on stage, right, be a spect actor, take a risk, not just sit and talk, and try out something new to address the problem, and then we analyze those ideas critically. And we were doing that for a few years since 2011, and a lot of the plays were about, you know, you go to the HRA office and you can't get your food stamps. Um, and you, you know, somebody would come up from the audience and try to say, you know, look, I really am hungry, I need my food stamps, and you're, you're dependent on whether the person at the HRA office is in a good mood today. And we were frustrated, this is not resistance uh, the way we need to have it, right? We can't depend for our human rights on whether somebody's in a good mood. And all of us who come to the theater, we all are already buying into this, we want to make a change, but the changes that we need to see are structural. And how do we make structural change in the theater? So we started to do legislative theater, which also my teacher, Augusto Boal, did when he was a council member in Rio. So I wasn't a council member, we weren't council members. So we had to get the city council and the city government and the federal government and the advocates and the lawyers into our theater. Um, so what we've been doing for the last five years is these same forum theater plays, right, always created and performed by the people facing the problem, um, because that's key to effective social change, we believe. And then the forum where we get to creatively challenge and imagine on stage, improvise, right? Re rehearsal for reality, new ideas. But then taking those new ideas into policy proposals in the theater that we sort with the help of what we call policy advisors, lawyers, advocates who've been working with the troop for months to prepare for that event. And then council members, city government, commissioners of city agencies, coming together to commit to the proposals that the audience have come up with. And through that process, we've also developed post and pre-show advocacy fairs, um, uh, trainings for audience members, how do we push those ideas forward. Uh, and we've had various successes with policy change that come out of our events. So uh, one little example um, before I wrap up is uh, a couple years ago, Councilmember Carlos Menchaca, chair of the Immigration Committee, He's again, the chair of the Immigration Committee as of yesterday, um, and, uh, and happens to be a council member who studied theater in college, right? That's a great way to get the council into your shows. <laughs> um, and uh, he saw a play by a trans uh, youth troupe, um, and one of the actors had a story of being a, a survivor of domestic violence. The cops came to her um, home and after an incident of domestic violence and they asked for her ID and because she didn't have ID that matched her name and her gender identity, they used that as an excuse to search her home, find um, uh, syringes for hormones and accuse her of uh, drug paraphernalia and arrest her. 
So the audience identified that as a problem, as a violation of human rights, and came, came up with a proposal that the city should have legislation to have uh, IDs that allow young people or anyone to change their gender marker without proof of surgery, doctor's notes, other things that are barriers. Happened to be that Carlos Menchaca was proposing the municipal ID at that time. He stayed and talked with the actors and audience uh, and committed to that proposal there in the legislative theater event and it became part of the legislation. So uh, that's uh, one of the ways uh, that we are in this. And uh, I hope to see you all at a TONYC uh, show in the future. So thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. And now we're going to continue with Theater of the Oppressed, but move across the world to India and to Jana Sanskriti. It's a Theater of the Oppressed company in Badu, which is just outside of Calcutta in India. Sanjari and Shima are my teachers of Theater of the Oppressed. And they use theater of the oppressed in India with as much heart and soul and purpose as, as Katie does in New York City. Sanjay and Shima uh, live communally with their actors and are part of the fabric of daily life in their own village. And they work in 27 other villages throughout rural West Bengal. And my experience of seeing what happens, what they have created in India is profound. And they go into this, the villages, they go back to the village with the same story, the same forum play until, uh, which is an interactive form of theater, until the issues in the village are resolved and they don't uh, get as many interventions and therefore they know the village has gotten uh, what they need to get and they move on to a new play. Um, they, uh, I, I remember being on a bus we came to the end of the road, we got onto bicycle rickshaws, then we came to the end of the road and then we walked into what seemed like the complete wilderness, the jungle, and, and to perform, and I thought, no one's gonna come to this, and out of the countryside poured 2,000 people chanting Jana Sanskriti and Forum Theater, and they came from everywhere to watch this. So, Sanjoy, um, and his wife Shima have had a profound effect on, uh, on their community in India, and it's with a profound uh, honor that we share this short video of Jana Sanskriti. There are two videos. Uh, for me, theater is a democratic communication between actors and spectators. It is democratic. And in theater, we can see ourselves in the act of seeing. We can become the spectator of our own actor. And therefore we discover ourselves. We discover our potentials and we discover our oppressive personality. If we have any oppressive personality in us, that also we can discover. And by discovering this oppressive personality, we can invite a positive conflict between the human being we have inside and the oppressive personality we have inside the conflict and that conflict produces humanization so theater can humanize the human beings it's a communication it's an inward communication you can be the spectator of our own actor and theater is also all about construction of relationship we construct relationship with our spectators creating a positive conflict we have information here in our head that we have got from our experience and the theater gives us some more in, uh, information from the stage those, in, those in the information we receive from the stage and the information we have in our head, they conflict. And this conflict also produces, creates intellectual growth. And that intellectual growth inspires us to go for an external transformation. So we can transform us internally by discovering ourselves and we can also feel inspired to transform our reality. So it's all about, theater is all about rehearsal of total transformation. And my last point is theatre is acting and acting has a dual meaning. We act on the stage as actors and also we act outside the stage as activists. So theatre should combine the both, acting and activism, that's all. Is it two minutes? <laughs>
seen some of their student companies in one of the 27 villages, but again, please check out their website and see their work. Next, we move to um, Arts Rights Justice EU, and we'll meet Lillian Fellman, who's the managing director of that organization. I just want to speak very briefly to the history of Theatre Without Borders' relationship to the issue of Arts Rights Justice. Um, we, a few years ago, created a relationship with Free Dimensional, and in a revolutionary act, <laughs> we created a button on our website that, uh, for artists at risk that linked to Free Dimensional. That went to Roberto Guerrera, who is a TWB member in San Francisco, and myself, one in Spanish, one in English. And with the connection to Sid Joag, Todd Lester, and Marianne de Vliet, we uh, continued that collaboration with Theatre Without Borders and, and Free Dimensional. Uh, we were invited, I, I went to the Mellon Foundation and we created a green paper for artists at risk. And Roberta and I met with uh, Julie at Penn, and you'll hear from later, and Deborah Brown at Brown Global Advocacy. This led to the Heat Collective and Theatre Without Borders being invited to become members of Arts Rights Justice EU. Um, so it's with great pleasure I introduce you to our friend Lillian Feldman at Arts Rights Justice. And she's based in Edinburgh. Good morning, this is Lillian Feldman, the uh, Chair and Coordinator of Arts Rights Justice EU. We are an independent working group focusing on human rights violations in the arts. Since 2014, Arts Rights Justice is uh, working on the umbrella of Culture Action Europe, the political platform of the arts and culture in Europe. We are about 30 organizations, associations, networks and individuals that um, do this work um, on a volunteering basis. We are members from Europe mainly, not the EU, I mean the wider Europe, uh, as well as from Africa, South America, um, the USA and Turkey. Our membership is free. Um, the focus of our work is to build up knowledge within the sector on rights. We want to make sure that um, the operators in the arts and culture field know their artists' rights, know their creative rights um, and are able to understand them and to protect them. Last year, 2017 spring, we embarked on a new four-year project where we look at the arts freedom situation in Europe. Um, the situation here in Europe is shifting quite um, quickly in some countries where we observe uh, categorical and strategic deformation of the arts, artists and uh, cultural operators by the public sector, as well as we can see that private groups are um, claiming a voice and are, which is often uh, a rather destructive voice, targeting artists and um, the arts in general. Now, how do we care, collect cases on artists' rights violations? We do this through our members. They look around in their working areas, they look at their neighboring countries. We bring these cases together, we discuss them and we document them where it makes sense. And we feed them into various UN mechanisms to influence policy writing and we also work with Culture Action Europe who is um, working closely with the European departments and um, bodies. Uh, we also make sure that the knowledge we create in the group um, is widely spread so we offer workshops 
to where we look at cases, we look at local situations, we look at uh, law, we look at uh, legislation at the country or um, municipality that we're invited to go to so that local operators understand the context, the legal framework that they're working in and learn to um, protect their rights in that context. I very much want to encourage you to get in touch with me if you want to know more about our work. We are, as I said, a free membership. We are happy to grow. Please um, go to the Culture Action Europe website and look out for the section Rights. You find there an AOJ logo. Click on that and you will get um, to see and find a few more descriptions about our work and what's most important, you'll find our contact email. So please do get in touch and have a wonderful day today. Thank you. Bye. In 2006, Israeli and Palestinian former combatants, people who had taken an active role in the conflict, laid down their weapons and established Combatants for Peace. The egalitarian, binational, grassroots organization was founded on the belief that the cycle of violence can only be broken when Israelis and Palestinians join forces. Two of the co-founders of Combatants for Peace are Israeli Fen Alon and Palestinian Suleiman Khatib. Here they are. I was four years old when we were attacked on Yom Kippur. I remember us running to the shelter in Tel Aviv. It's very concrete for a child. They want to kill us. And I really didn't understand why do they hate us so much. <laughs> I was admitted into the most prestigious unit in the Israeli army. I was extremely proud. I knew my father was proud. I decided to be a leader of the society. It's a moment. It's just a moment of terror. It's a moment of terror. Someone came to me and said that there are Palestinians who are willing to meet with us. I was very afraid that there could be a place. We find that we actually have something in common. That willingness to kill people, you don't know. عندهم قوة جميلة مش طبيعي. الجيل اللي كان واحد من المقاتلين عجل السلام رفضوا الظلم يغيروها. إذا أنت كريتي عم نزور مانديلا، آه شخص لحاله غير دوله بقى كان كان كل الدين وغير كل النظام. ممكن تعرف إنه شخص لحاله كل شخص لحاله كيف كده يسويه؟ كيف كده يسويه؟ Last year, Combatants for Peace was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And just to connect everything up, they also work with Theater of the Oppressed tools and techniques. Um, in Israel and Palestine, so please check them out. We're not going to be able to show our second video with them speaking to us, but 
their work is deeply important. Now I'm going to introduce to you Jonathan Math, who is head of the Fence Network. Any Fence members out there? Yay! Yeah, there's some people out there. Fence is a, an international organization of playwrights and translators. Um, Jonathan is a dear friend. He and I are working on the European production of my play, My Heart is in the East, which is about Jewish and Muslim relations. So uh, he's very much about inclusivity and uh, we are working with uh, something called Friday, Saturday, Sunday in London, which is uh, a building that is Friday it's a mosque, Saturday it's a synagogue, and Sunday it's a church. So um, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, so I go to London regularly to work with him, and the last time I was there, he invited to me, a, a, me to a very strange event. It was weird. and But I'd never seen sort of... Um, political theater created in this strange way. So I asked him to make a little video about it. He did not do that. He instead, <laughs> he, camera shy, he uh, did an audio and sent us some slides. So we're gonna see how this works. Thank you, this is Jonathan Meth. Hello, and thank you very much for inviting me to participate in today's theater resistance symposium. My name is Jonathan Meth. I'm going to talk to you today about one of the Fence Network's projects, I Struck Oil, but will it be Norway or Nigeria? <coughs> this is a pilot performance project for the Fence, in partnership with King's College London, staged in their Natalie Theatre and Museum last October as part of their Arts and Humanities Festival. The project staged an audio recorded performance and discussion for a live audience on an imagined future scenario. Let me, with the help of a few photographs from the evening, try and paint you the picture. Student ambassadors strike up conversations with arriving audience members about iron striking it oil rich. Up to the sixth floor we go, in an elevator marked to the near future. We're then invited into a traditional steep rate lecture theatre, where the downstage presentation area has been converted into a pop-up Guinness bar. <laughs> the giant on the down projector screen is showing a film by Northern Irish artist Jonathan Armour of oil, its textures, movements, <coughs> and textures. The three piece Liverpool Query Brothers are playing traditional sounding Irish tunes from the middle of the lecture theatre. Some of these are in fact related to Bobby Sands. Some people will have this as such, others will not. Out of the assembling audience and their other, Writer, performer, and stand up comedian Tara Flynn pops up to give a 15 minute monologue on where she was when she heard Arnold had struck oil and what struck her about it. This sets the tone for the evening. It's playful, serious, but comic. While the audience refills their glasses, we're then ushered through into the Anatomy Museum. As we take our formally arranged seats, we encounter three Jonathan Armour artworks in plexiglass, acrylic, and on screen variously presenting the naked <coughs> anatomised in forms akin to the map of Ireland, the body politic, if you will. A radio sound recordist explains to the audience that we're to be part of a radio recording and that certain protocols will therefore need to be observed. Author and World Service producer Colin Grant oversees the audio recording for future podcast event. Our host is Dubliner and Dabiri, a black Irish academic from the School of Oriental and African Studies. We are introduced to our two permanent expert panel members, journalists Onya Kachi Wamu. <laughs> Dabiri then asks us famous questions in three successive types of panelists, all from Irish, Scottish, and English playwrights, academics, and activists, which cover one environment and ecology. Two, governance and investment, and three, foreign relation. The event's creative editor, playwright Gabriel Balamosi, then interviews Chris Mottisek, 30 years at VP Royal Executive and Senior Vice Principal of Research at Queen's College. So I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to fade this out because I think it's kind of hard to hear him. This is an experiment that I think didn't work. But it, at least you got to get a sense of it. Did you get a sense of what it was? Because um, in the picture of me, the, the woman next to me is saying, she's an English woman who's saying, Jess, Jess, did, I didn't read the paper. Did, did, 
did Ireland strike oil this morning? My God, you know, she really believed it. So it was one of those War of the Worlds things that, that people actually thought Ireland struck oil. And these experts from both Nigeria and Norway were suggesting what to do. The, um, the general outcome of advice was keep it in the ground. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Back to uh, Palestine, um, Iman Aou is co-founder of the Ashtar Theater, which uses oppressed theater techniques in its international repertoire. Ashtar is a dynamic local Palestinian theater with a progressive global perspective. It aims to promote creativity and commitment for change through a novel combination of specific training and acting programs <laughs> and services and professional theater performances. Here is Iman Aou. Hello everybody, I'm glad to be with you today in the conference of uh, Theatre Without Borders uh, to address you about uh, theatre and resistance. Well, I was hesitant for a long time uh, of what I would be saying, especially now that uh, Trump had declared Jerusalem as the eternal capital for Israel. Um, and uh, I was really uh, Heard as uh, a Palestinian, as a Jerusalemite, and I, I had so much anger inside me, and I didn't want to convey this anger to all of you because I know that um, we, as uh, theatre makers uh, from around the world and also from the U.S., we do share um, the importance of uh, humanity, and uh, we do share the love of uh, change and. Um, making peace through our art. But uh, certainly resistance for us in Palestine, uh, and in particular for me uh, as a theater maker at Ashtar Theatre, um, I see that resistance is part of our daily existence. Because uh, we all the time um, face different kinds of atrocities from the occupation uh, that really puts us in, in a way where we have to um, safeguard and, um, and protect our humanity, our story, and the story of our people, as well uh, as we are the protectors of the hope, because, and especially, young people uh, are all the time uh, facing despair and facing anger and facing um, the oppression and which creates um, reaction and uh, reflection to uh, to all the um, atrocities that uh, that they face on daily basis but on the other hand what we try to do as theater makers we try to cultivate hope in, uh, in the mind and in the hearts of our young people. And not only the young, but also uh, our community in general. We do so in uh, making training that tackles the uh, most essential uh, issues the people face. We try to focus on our uh, society um, and uh, the problems that our society face, uh, whether women or uh, children or uh, youth um, in, in a variety of, uh, of domains. Um, and uh, we try to give them um, the strength within them. We try to open up a space where they would search for their own freedom, the freedom uh, of their voice, the freedom of their uh, choice, the freedom uh, of their uh, ability to make a change in their society. And for us, this is a way uh, of resisting the uh, continuous occupation and continuous uh, oppression that we face. On the other hand, um, as theatre makers, we also uh, use our art 
uh, and our skills to raise issues on uh, the theatre platform, to talk to our uh, audience, and to talk to the world uh, in general, in order to realize and understand um, who we are, uh, what our goals, uh, what we do, and what our will is. Uh, now, I know that um, the international um, force uh, is going towards uh, colonialism and uh, materialism much more than going towards uh, the voice of the heart. But our goal as theatre makers, as art makers, is to uh, keep the sanity of our, uh, of our societies. I see theatre as the main, or one of the main domains that makes us more humane, that help us understand who we are, what we want, and how to reach a collective of better life and um, better um, approach to our humanity. Um, in our work, especially in, in our um, professional uh, performances, we also try to uh, raise our story and uh, put them forth um, as uh, facts, because one of the most important uh, um, issues is that uh, the colonial occupation is trying to diminish our story, to diminish our presence, and to change the history on the ground. And our role is mainly uh, to protect that history um, in order to, um, to resist the dissolving of our presence on our own land. Um, and uh, in this case, we also try to be um, um, like one with, with the other uh, groups of theatre makers. Uh, we are um, partnering with you, you are partnering with us, and I'm sure that we all uh, face the same uh, kind of, um, of loot or of uh, resistance because we believe that uh, we want a better life and we all deserve a better life and therefore um, we share uh, the common dream that we work for. Thank you. So now we're moving to New Mexico from Palestine. The Working Classroom is a multi-ethnic, intergenerational community of students and professional artists, writers, and actors with a conscious commitment to supporting new and diverse voices. They contribute to a more nuanced understanding of American identity, training aspiring artists and actors from historically ignored communities. Megan Gomez, their director, took me on a tour of their facilities this fall, and I was impressed by the studios filled with youth making activist art and theater of vibrant resistance. So here is the working classroom in Albuquerque.
play, but it's presenting possibilities. The idea behind this project was that the students would have an opportunity to work with multiple guest artists, not just one person. There's a particular strength that comes from having guest artists from different backgrounds. So with Scott, we have someone who comes from Tectonic Theater Project, which is a very well-established theater program, and he offers theatrical experimentation. With Milta, coming from Borderlands Theater, we have this influence from the Southwest and from California, where she's from. Her influence is more movement-based and also more writing-heavy. What I've noticed with the students and their ability to just create, it has just increased exponentially. The sophistication of the work that they're making is visible, it's palpable. When you present it to people, they say, well, how much of that was directed? How much of that came from the students? And we can proudly say, this is the students. A cornerstone of working classrooms philosophy is the idea that teachers don't know more than students. We've just been around longer. It's about walking into the room and saying, what did you notice this week? What did you read this week? What's sticking with you right now? And so by doing that, we create a more organic opportunity for them to voice their own thoughts and their own vision for the future. I like to think of the education project as kind of a map for the future. These students, by doing these interviews and creating research and writing what's important to them, they are writing a play to help find solutions for the future. They are building something together. The real strength of this work is not just the play itself, but what the play represents. It's about not being complacent in your world and being able to stand up for who you are and what you need. <laughs> We're setting our goal at $10,000. $10,000 will allow us to tour extensively throughout the state, provide free... <laughs> so I just want to shout out to Michael for doing such a seamless and gorgeous job letting the light and and I have a real live person. Um, so, uh, in 1979, when I was three, I was in the resident company at La Mama um, and was shaken by the glorious earthquake that was Ellen Stewart. And I've had the great pleasure of working at La Mama over the past few years um, in New York and as a teacher at the Director's Symposium in Umbria, and have watched Mia, you, flourish as a leader of fierce grace. Uh, Mia, I, I remember uh, when we did an action with the Belarus Freak Theater, where we got into body bags in uh, near City Hall. Mia was the first in a body bag. Some artists were cheating and brought their cell phones in with them, but Mia went in there bravely and stayed in that body bag till the very end of the demonstration. I've also uh, watched her in Umbria dealing with VIP actors with large egos and large bodies of work, and at the same time hanging laundry on the line for the uh, participants of workshops. Um, I have seen her dressed to kill, uh, leading a, uh, a gala event, and I think she's a brilliant, incomparable mama, both to us all and to her daughter, Yuna. She's a brilliant actress, a wonderful artistic director, a great friend, and a fierce and gorgeous holder of the light, of Ellen's light and of the light to come. And now David's going to say something. <laughs> when gets a double barrel introduction. Uh, tomorrow uh, on the 13th is the memorial of uh, the passing of Ellen Stewart. And uh, I think that the community of artists that were impacted by La Mama and by Ellen uh, are honored that the legacy of Ellen Stewart is being carried on uh, by Mia Yu and um, continuing to provide experimental artists a home. She expanded on the work 
embracing new technologies, and providing access to artists from around the world whose stories don't get heard. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very pleased to introduce me and you. Here, I get emotional, and um, <laughs> just recently, Adam Hafez just told me about the last time I was here and how I teared up and made him tear up. But um, uh, let's see, I didn't have much sleep last night. Um, it was a hard night, I, I'm, I'm imagining for a lot of us in this room. Um, so if I do get emotional, that might have a little something to do, you know, something to do with. productions a season. And that is because at the core, we believe there must be as many artist voices coming from as many places as possible at the table. And then we rely on these artists to drive the direction of where we're going. The dialogues that we have, the work that we present, the issues that we bring up and confront, the way we think about art and its purpose in society, the way we engage with our local and global communities. We believe that through this diversity of backgrounds and perspectives, new directions in art making, and ultimately ways of looking at the world can open up. And this happened <coughs> from the beginnings of La Mama, which was founded in 1961 in a basement on East 9th Street by Ellen Stewart, a visionary who saw a need for space for artists in the margins. These artists she were encountering were exploring theater making and writing that was non-traditional, <coughs> non-commercial, unconventional, and this began the off-off Broadway movement. And you can imagine what these artists were thinking about as the women's, civil rights, <coughs> anti-war, gay rights movements were all exploding. So La Mama puts its trust in the artists and we jump off that cliff with them. That relationship is essential to what we do and who we are. So I think here we could go on about sort of how art can transform and, and be a vehicle to bring people and communities together, but I, I feel like most of the room already believes that. So I would love to talk about something that has been pulling at me recently and, and, um, and maybe in a more rigorous way. Sitting in the theater, as I watch all this incredible work that these artists are doing, I struggle with this idea that the work is happening in our theaters, that this work that is happening in our theaters is preaching to the choir, to the already converted, 
And this is still important for its inspiration, for strength, for hope. But how do we get beyond the four walls of these theaters, which feel so freaking fucking necessary in the times that we are living? So La Mama has historically gone abroad. The companies have toured and nothing, nothing, nothing will replace that experience of being physically in the room together. But now there are many ways that we can make these connections. How can we engage artists, audiences, and communities in a time when interactivity is so much a part of how we interact with the world? This fourth industrial revolution that is of new digital technologies, which has probably been a reason why we're in the part of the reason of why we're here today and, and the situation that we're in, is changing this interaction. And art and artists can help us navigate this transition as they have in the past. In 2009, La Mama and the Seoul Institute of the Arts founded Culture Hub. In the interest of time, I will give you a few examples of what we have been, do examples of what we have been doing. We have had our La Mama kids workshops in storytelling and chanting with kids in our neighborhood, connecting and sharing with kids in Alaska at the Alaska Native Heritage Center through video conferencing technology. We are live streaming our shows and having global talkbacks with folks online afterwards. We have performances that have occurred in, uh, with audiences in both simultaneously in Manchester and in New York City. We have brought artists together to talk about contemporary art practices from Iran. Artists would, who would have difficulty coming into this country. After the earthquake, we connected to artists in Haiti who were running their computers off of a generator. But these interactions must go deeper. And more of this content, and, their co and, and vice versa, the content coming from the other side, can be shared in new ways. These are the questions that we are grappling with, and I believe we must continue and be more rigorous in this exper experimentation and exploration. So I'm just going to show you a little clip of some of the work and, and show you what it is, what, what was happening. So these were uh, youth from the Bronx, the Triborough area, uh, connecting with folks in Berlin, with youth in Berlin. This is that Manchester simultaneous production that happened. This is our, oh no, this is with Ashe in New Orleans, um, a dance workshop that happened with folks in Cartagena, Colombia, another simultaneous performance with folks in, in New York City and Seoul. So in a way, you know, what Ellen was doing in an adult time, we're just taking that on and, and figuring out how these digital technologies can help us as opposed to us. So, you know, as I show this, I feel as though this is not enough. And um, so the explorations and the experimentations have to continue. And we, we, you know, with our partners and hopefully more partners, maybe some of you in this room today, we will continue that work. We have to. Thank you. We are at our last speaker. Um, thank you for hanging in there to hear all these amazing voices. Um, Derek Goldman is the founding director of the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics, the professor of theater and perform a professor of theater and performance studies at Georgetown University, the vice president of ITI, the International Theater Institute, and director of ITI UNESCO Network for Higher Education in the Performing Arts. 
He is also one of the warmest and most inclusive practitioners I know. He blends generosity and intelligence to move mountains. I was lucky enough to be present at the ITI World Congress in Segovia last summer to witness the marvelous work he curated with international youth. Please welcome Derek Goldman. Good morning, thanks for that uh, all too generous introduction. I'm aware that time is short, so I will talk a little bit fast. Um, but I wanna just um, extend kind of personal huge thanks to uh, everybody responsible for this kind of beautiful, um, uh, hope-filled gathering, um, uh, particularly dear friends from Theater Without Borders and here at the Siegel Center. I'm really honored to be part of it and properly humbled to be following Mia um, and the spirit of uh, what she left us with. Um, just briefly, um, the lab is uh, based uh, at Georgetown in Washington, D.C., where I teach. My uh, co-founding director is Ambassador Cynthia Schneider, um, and we're, uh, I'm a theater maker. Uh, she's not, so we're an interesting, uh, complicated, dynamic duo. Um, and our mission is to harness the power of performance to humanize global politics, something that as I look around this room, I feel like is uh, something that virtually every person in this room is already doing. Um, we're based in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, which I think is worth mentioning because we're a bit unusual as an arts initiative situated within a leading school of international relations. I'm a theater professor, um, as, as Jessica mentioned, but it gives us a kind of access and proximity to uh, leading policy makers, think tanks, embassies, um, and we're working, doing, you know, uh, creating courses and curriculum at this um, intersection. Uh, it's, of course, a very interesting, compelling time to be uh, uh, in Washington in this time and place trying to do this work. We have colleagues who are former recent cabinet, make, uh, cabinet members, not cabinet makers. That's a, whole, that's a, different, that's a different department. Uh, we're invested in the future of cabinet making. Um, uh, so, um, and past, present, and future State Department folks, et cetera, and I think it's, uh, we don't take for granted that Georgetown School of Foreign Service has put uh, art, empathy, narrative, um, uh, at the core of what it's doing alongside security studies and the kind of pieces on a chessboard approach um, and we're, uh, and our students especially and, and the sort of ripples that's creating are, uh, I, I think, have been very, um, it's just been an inspiring place to try to do that work. Um, we, uh, the lab develops, creates, produces, and presents new work in collaboration with an expansive global network of artists around issues such as migration and refugee issues uh, uh, and immigration, uh, climate, human trafficking, privacy, the legacy of slavery, which as many of you know has been a uh, big thing on Georgetown's campus with the uh, uh, discovery of the sale of 272 slaves in 1838 that kept the campus afloat. So we've been working with the descendant community around the complex issues that that raises. We did a two-year festival around Muslim voices and Islamophobia. But I think we see ourselves above all, and this is why this room feels so powerful to me, um, as about uh, existing to strengthen existing networks and to foster relationship building from the particular place we sit to amplify a lot of the amazing work that so many others are already doing. Um, uh, and we have a fellows program funded by Mellon with 10 pathbreaking uh, artists working at these intersections from Syria, Palestine, Cambodia, Zimbabwe, Colombia. Um, we have a think tank of colleagues working around the world in this area, and we host convenings and conversations. Recently one with Belarus Free Theater and artists from Syria and um, Iran and other places around artists' rights issues, freedom of expression issues, uh, particularly in contexts of increased repression. Uh, very much uh, kin, kin with what m many of my predecessors had mentioned already. Um, so knowing that we're at time, I just want to quickly also mention, we partner, as many of you know, with TCG, Theater Communications Group, dear colleagues Emilia Cacciapero and Teresa Iring and Kevin Bitterman on the Global Theater Initiative, which exists to strengthen, nurture, and promote global citizenship in professional and educational theater fields. And as part of that, we are the U.S. Center of ITI. And I would just say about ITI, it is, if you don't know ITI, we are working really hard to make it 
uh, um, it's, it's getting younger and more vibrant and more inclusive, so much because of the many years of leadership that Amelia has provided, paving, creating that space. And so we're really looking to engage more people through this network that Jessica mentioned for higher education and in other ways. Um, and so the last thing I'll leave you with is that I think when we founded the lab, we assumed that, um, you know, that the artists would really get it and that folks in other sectors would limp along and we would chisel away at those sectors. And in fact, the momentum that we've achieved to the degree we have, I would say that largely the inverse has been true. That what has happened is that it's the folks in other sectors, in the policy world, who are looking to the skills that that we as theater people bring um, to be at the table uh, to help engage issues they feel are broken in their worlds. And sometimes it's the theater folks and the theater communities who are struggling to figure out the ways to move through those doors. So I think my greatest hope uh, about uh, a gathering like this is that the new partnerships and relationships that we're building can help us move through those doors together. So thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you guys. We're gonna. David's gonna introduce the next section, but I just want to thank you for uh, for so much listening, so much active listening. And uh, again, we're gonna move to through two more sections, and then you'll get a chance to to talk. So thanks for hanging in there. Thank you. There, there was uh, there was one other group that uh, had wanted to present in this uh, first section, which we didn't have time to include. I wanted to bring their names into the room. Now that is. Uh, uh, Bernardo Ray and Nube Sandoval, former uh, recipients of the Ellen Stewart International Award, who are from Col uh, Colombia and whose work is involved with uh, refugees. They did an extraordinary piece in Italy with refugees coming across the Mediterranean and landing in Lampedusa, which I encourage you to check out. So um, we don't have time to hear from them, but I wanted to bring that to your attention. Uh, now we're going to move into uh, a, a conversation among artists. I'd like to invite Saviana, Mia, Katrine, Martha, and Jessica to the stage. Everybody else, take a big stretch, stand up, stretch yourself for a second. It's been sitting for a while now, so we're going to just uh, we'll get everybody up on the stage and jump right in. challenges you're facing and have faced, and what strategies you use to get past them. Now, with this amazing group of artists, I could spend the entire time all afternoon actually introducing and explaining uh, what all they have accomplished in their exemplary work, but I won't do that. I encourage you to look more deeply into uh, their work when you get home. But for now, I'll just touch the surface with a brief introduction so audiences know uh, who will have the good fortune to hear today. Uh, all the way at the far end, Saviano Stanescu is an award-winning playwright, poet, and activist who created the organization Immigrant Artists and Scholars New York. She's from Romania, and her plays have been published in English and Romanian. Won't go through all the accolades. <laughs> 
Next to her is Katrine Fiu, an award-winning playwright who has been writing about human rights and social justice, social justice for over 20 years. A committed activist, she is one of the co-founders of Theatre Without Borders. Um, in the middle is Jessica Litwack, who you have met already, an international theater practitioner, drama therapist, and a leader in the field of socially engaged theater. She is an award-winning playwright, equity actor, innovative educator, director, and puppet builder. Uh, next, we have uh, Martha. Martha Redbone is one of the world's most vital voices in the American roots music. In addition to her acclaim as an artist, a vocalist, a songwriter, her activism includes advocacy for Native and African American youth, AIDS awareness, women and girls empowerment, and as a voice for indigenous peoples. Uh, directly uh, to my left is Nia Astro Witherspoon. She's a multidisciplinary artist investigating the metaphysics of black liberation, desire, and diaspora. She works primarily in the mediums of theater performance, vocal and sound composition, and creative scholarship. Again, just a brief introduction. There's so much more to say, but I want to let them talk. So please help me welcome everybody here. Thank you. So this is a question for, for everyone. Maybe we could just uh, take it one at a time, but uh, I would love for you to um, tell us about a particular project or instance that you can point to that you would consider a success in your work towards uh, resistance. What were you trying to achieve and, and how did you go about it? Saviana, do you want to, uh, to start? Everybody, please use the microphones because of the live stream, they need to have it on. Can you just press the button? Okay. Can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, uh, first I want to briefly introduce myself. So, I grew up during the totalitarian regime of Ceausescu in Romania. I was in the streets at the revolution in 1989. And I think that um, my life in Romania and what happened after the revolution, of course, influenced my work as a theater maker and a playwright. Of course, during the totalitarian regime, uh, theater and writing generally was a form of resistance, as we were reading our poems in underground spaces and um, you know, facing censorship and even the possibility of being arrested. Um, then after fighting with my colleagues, college students in the streets of the revolution, I started to work as um, a journalist in the newly created free press. So, in a way, all my art, and I consider myself an activist, um, as a writer and a theater maker, responds to the issues around me. When I was in Romania, I was writing plays and creating performances, responding and raising awareness to what was happening in the country after the revolution, the corruption, and other issues uh, over there in Eastern Europe. And since I came to the US in 2001, two weeks before 9-11. Of course, my perspective changed, but I'm still pretty much concerned about the fight of the individual against the system and how can we respond as individuals and as communities to what rules and the unfair rules are imposed by the system. So most of my plays here in America, uh, my plays in English, are about immigrants, are about outcasts, are about newcomers, about the marginals, about the oppressed, about the different, about the others, and how people can be othered as being different, as being uh, not the uh, mainstream uh, type of a person. So um, maybe if you are asking me to talk about only one project, I think my play, The Alliance with Extraordinary Skills, has been quite successful uh, in a more <laughs> commercial way. Uh, while um, I think my work generally is more avant-garde and more experimental, um, I do feel that, unfortunately, in order to be heard by more people here in the US, uh, you do have to penetrate the system as a playwright and have your plays produced in larger venues so more people can uh, hear them and see them and uh, talk about them. 
So, uh, Aliens with Extraordinary Skills was presented in multiple theaters in the US, here in New York at Women's Project. It was translated in Spanish and presented in Mexico City at Teatro La Capilla, where it ran for uh, two years in the repertory, and in many other countries as Turkey, uh, Sweden, Romania. And um, are these issues of aliens <laughs> as uh, immigrants, as undocumented immigrants? or documented immigrants, of course, are still very much present, as I was listening this morning on NPR, uh, what President Trump said about some countries and how they would rather have immigrants from Norway than from other countries. Well, fortunately, we cannot all be from Norway. So uh, I'm going to um, say that. And maybe my other success story is my play Waxing West, about the Romanian uh, who came to uh, the US. It's not fully autobiographical, but it is about being haunted of the ghost, by the ghost of the past, by dictator Ceausescu and his wife, who appear as vampires, as Bolivarian <laughs> vampires. Because, you know, as George Bernard Shaw said, if you are to tell people the truth, you better make them laugh, otherwise they'll kill you. So. <laughs> Place, you know, can yeah. try to be a little funny so people can get the message with a little bit um, of, of sugar, I guess. And this play, Wars in West, uh, as I'm leaving tomorrow for Washington, D.C., is being produced in the Women's uh, Voices Theater Festival in D.C. starting next week. Great, and we will we'll talk a little about this challenge that you raised about. Um, uh, it's particularly getting the voices out there and heard by more people. I think that's a, a common. Uh, challenge for, for a lot of us. Um, I'd like to move the uh, conversation over here now. Nia, I would wonder if you could uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your response to this question. Hi everyone, good afternoon, um, or morning if the case may be. I've been up for a long time. Um, <laughs> um, okay, sure, a success. I will answer the, pro the question really uh, I'll try to be as precise as possible because um, I think I'd like to use this production that I'm going to talk about as kind of a case study throughout the, because it has the successes and the challenges, I think, uh, embedded in both. Um, so uh, the, the, the project is called The Messiah Complex, and um, it was commissioned by Brick Lab Premier. Uh, it was a, the first in the Brick Lab premiere program, so it's a premiering venue. Brick Lab, if you know, is a more of a residency where work is in development. Um, and so this was the kind of inaugural project where um, it tried to premiere a large work. Uh, the piece really looks at the relationship between being sacred and honored and held up in community, as well as uh, being scapegoated and persecuted simultaneously within the same body. Um, and the Messiah that, in my vision of this piece, is a black trans man. Um, and the play who, who uh, as a teenager, trying to save his own passing, murders a black trans woman on the train, on the subway. Um, and so the project really is looking at this deep level of internalized violence the deepest level of internalized violence. And in this kind of process, I, I did not, uh, my, my goal was to produce this work with a predominantly black, queer, trans, and gender non-conforming cast and creative team, uh, which is really, really hard to do. Um, when going into the challenges. <laughs> uh, what was successful about this? <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna get to I know, I know, it's like, it's a complicated thing. It. But no, um, I, I think that what was, what's, what's complicated about this is that um, just briefly, black, queer, trans, and gender non-conforming folks are not uh, people who are encouraged, uh, for whom theater seems a possibility, right? Um, and so finding people from OK Cupid to, <laughs> To, you know, like really having to be creative about, and that shout out to um, a director that I worked with for that idea, that was dope. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but really having to understand that, thinking about what does it mean to go outside of the four walls, as, as was stated earlier, um, you know, 
what does it mean to bring community and theater together in a way that uh, doesn't assume that there are, uh, that there are that there are roads already set up for that. Um, so what does it mean to kind of make those roads? So the project was successful in that we, we got a group of absolutely incredible performers, um, and also that we got a group of an incredible creative team that was directed by um, Charlotte Brathwaite. It, um, we had um, uh, Justin Hicks as a sound designer, Nigel Whitson as the choreographer. It was drama turked by Sheree Moraga, who was my graduate school playwriting mentor. Um, and so really like the confluence of absolutely astounding uh, creative energy in, um, in the space and then what that did and uh, the process that we were able to create in the room because of the level of belief in the vision um, in the ritual of the piece, the belief in um, the absolute necessity of our voices in the world and also the really deep urgency we all felt as endangered bodies and endangered beings and the way in which that informed um, our everyday. Um, really, uh, and, then, and then like the, the uphill battle with Brick, I love Brick, Brick who is an amazing uh, producing organization, but also like, yes, people will come, I swear, I know people will come, right? Um, and having to have that conversation um, and then have like, a sold out run and that was extended, but all, like that was the success. Um, the success was that we did it, we, we gathered ourselves and we gathered our people and they came. And the challenge and the failure was that that was five nights <laughs> of glory, right? But, uh, but that, you know, and we gotta do it all over again for the piece to be seen again. Um, and so I think that um, and, and also to like, if, and, I'll, and I'll close here because I've been going a minute, but, uh, but also to thinking that, thinking about what it means for um, a theater to centralize black, queer, trans, and gender non-conforming bodies and the ways in which that challenge the existing space. So like, you know, um, how, does, how does that mean we enter and exit the first time that Brick ever had to change their bathroom policy and signage, right? Like all of the ways in which our very presence in the space changes the space. Um, changes the requirements of the space. Um, we had a we we had um, a certain policy about pe how people were to enter and exit the room. We had uh, Black Queer Healer, amazing Julia from uh, Third Root, um, uh, doing healing and intermission, right? Like what is because we knew that we were triggering tons of trauma for already traumatized people. So like really, what does it mean? Uh, we had. Um, uh, Make the Road and Audrey Lord and all sorts of folks sending youth, you know, so uh, and we worked uh, really well with Brick's community engagement folks to do so. So really thinking about um, the success, it was the case study and a collaboration with a producing organization that I, I believe is major um, in making some of those shifts and all the work that, and, and, and what it opened up was all of the rest that would need to happen. Like, what are the structural shifts that wouldn't make that so hard? Um, is the question I was left with. Thank you. And, and I think we'll go into that a little deeper as we continue the conversation. I'll hear from each person first, and then we'll have some cross-conversation. Katrin, uh, yeah, would you take it? Uh, crack it down. Um. It's really wonderful to be here, uh, and I just want to start by saying, having been one of the people that co-founded Theater Without Borders with Roberta and Eric uh, after 9-11, um, uh, I'm filled with great, great hope to be here, really to look out at this audience, uh, especially after uh, the sort of constant onslaught uh, that continues to besiege us, um, so it's, it's just very, very um, moving to be here, and I thank you for having me. Um, I, I want to say that I'm just mostly here to share information and to brainstorm with people on how they might want to think about projects. Um, I am a freelance playwright, and um, my most recent play was at La Mama. I've had the honor of having my last three plays there. 
And my most recent play is about women in mass incarceration in the United States. You may know that the United States incarcerates more women than any other country in the world, pretty much. And uh, that play, What is Free Me, was commissioned by Nora's Playhouse and will be produced in July of 2018 at John Jay College, where I started working on the play with a woman who teaches there, Amy Green, and we co-taught a class uh, there called Drama and Mass Incarceration and pursued a lot of readings and working with the students there uh, through starting in 2016. Uh, then I went on to work with an amazing organization that Vivian Nixon runs called um, Community and a Fellowship, at, which is in New York, sorry, College and Community Fellowship in New York. And um, then recently we did a reading of the play at Vassar where, the, where I teach and the drama department chair Shona Tucker played the lead and we had students play all the other parts. And I'm sort of in the process right now of gathering a group of students from a bunch of different places to participate in this project. Uh, so one of the challenges that I've come up against that I wanted to talk about is with a beloved organization, Culture Hub, I've been trying desperately to think of how such a play could be live streamed. And we run up every time against the, the issue of actors' equity. Um, and it's just like such a Byzantine and sort of Sisyphean problem because like each time you talk to one group, they're like, oh no, no, they changed the rules, it's okay now. And then you go to another group and they're like, oh no, no, you know. So it's, it's really, when you look at Europe and, and the way that they've been able to uh, get their stuff on film, and, and I know this is very simplistic to say, but in any event, that has been a challenge, and I, I wanted to bring that up. Thank you. Yeah, and I thank you for, for doing that. I think that's one of the situations that, having worked for, I worked for the Stage Directors Union for a while, and uh, uh, understanding a little bit how those how unions operate that when a community like the community of people in this room were to go to equity and say, these are the issues that we really want you to address, they'll start to listen. I think uh, there's strength in numbers, and I think that that's one thing that a, a meeting like this can generate is some action that's very specific that can really make a, a change. I know they listen. Start a committee. They listen to the members. <laughs> I think that people should contact you. <laughs> Martha, uh, thank you. Martha, would you uh, care to go? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think um, there's, there's so many different um, projects and things that, that we've all been involved in, and each of them have touched me strongly. Um, I would, I'm trying to think of the most profound moment. Um, being an artist and an indigenous and African-American artist, um, we kind of fall between the cracks. and. Um, you know, being raised by the Eastern Woodman's mother in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. <laughs> um, you know, you do fall between the cracks, you know, as a teenager in New York City. And um, I always felt invisible, um, just simply because, you know, when you're in Brooklyn, you get to choose two uh, groups of people of color to belong to. Your, you know, Dominican, you know, a Latina or, or a Caribbean. And so when you are from Harlan County, Kentucky, you don't know <laughs> where you fit in. Um, on the wider, as time went on, um, I was in, asked to be on the advisory board of the Man Up campaign, which was founded by Jimmy Briggs and a global uh, youth movement to eradicate gender-based violence. And um, uh, Jimmy wrote an article, he was covering um, information about uh, crimes against Native American women uh, in, in Indian territories. And, um, and we both felt strongly that in recruiting this global youth movement, you know, we had uh, young people from the ages of 18 through 27 from 50 countries. And um, we both felt that with regards to the USA delegation, we felt that there should be a separate North American indigenous delegation because the needs of, of tribes 
and all of us in Indian country are very different from the United States. And so um, we ended up, you know, doing the call to action, and I went on a Native American call, Native America calling radio show, which is one of the, which is the largest radio talk radio shows in Indian country, and um, we ended up recruiting. We made two indigenous delegations uh, from seven different tribes, all who had, they were all creative people, all had their own uh, ways of communicating and sharing their stories of gender-based violence in their, in their communities. Um, some used drama therapy uh, when a person was a counselor in a domestic violence center, um, just in, um, uh, Milwaukee. We ended up having our first youth summit in Johannesburg. And as all of the delegations, we managed to raise enough funding to bring 25 delegations over to Johannesburg. So we hosted the first summit. And as all of the groups of students stood up to introduce their delegations and we're all cheering and everything, um, then my babies came, stood up and said, you know, we represent you know, the North American indigenous self, um, and delegation and everyone's clapping. And then um, the delegation from Uganda stood up for a second time across the, the theater. And they said, we already introduced ourselves, but um, we wanted to say welcome to the North American indigenous delegation. We thought you were dead. So I wasn't the only person who felt that we were invisible. And so this is something that I've dealt with my entire life. And I feel, and I still feel, that indigenous people in America and in Canada and all over the world, we are invisible. We need a voice. We are far from invisible. People don't recognize us today as indigenous people because of all of the, you know, the kind of, uh, ills of colonization and, and phenotypes that we're all addicted to. Um, we are very much alive, still have our cultures, our attorneys, artists. Um, there are 50,000 indigenous people in New York City. And people don't know that either. So that's, I feel that that was a huge accomplishment and um, something that um, started helping uh, give young people their voices as well to talk about who we are. And thanks to social media, now at least we all know that Standing Rock exists and there are some <laughs> indigenous people still around. So that's the beginning of it. So. Yeah, I think this, this question again comes up about visibility and about um, uh, pe people who are not, as Amir was saying, the converted people are, who are already right. know, getting to know what's going on around them that they're not aware of. So I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, Jessica, please share some of your many successes. At least one for now. I successfully turned on the microphone. <laughs> um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the Fear Project, but before I was making all these signs to Saviana, which obviously weren't clear, because I wanted her <laughs> to mention the Dream Acts, because, um, and you mentioned Chiori, didn't you just mention Chiori Miyagawa? Did you? Oh, you didn't. I'm sorry, I heard that. I heard that somewhere. But Chiori and Saviana and I and Andrea Tom and Mia Chum uh, wrote uh, together a project about undocumented youth. So it goes right to what you were talking about. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Because I think, be I, I just, is that okay, David? I just think that this is an important, um, moment to talk about this because we wrote the play uh, and then we thought because DACA was was alive that we didn't need to perform the play anymore and now we need to perform the play again so at Artists Rise Up the Divide on the 29th at La Mama we are going to do a reading of Dream Acts which is um, and the only only other thing I want to say before Saviana speaks is that for me success is when people come together collectively like this Yes, we are speak, we are preaching to the choir today, but I think the choir needs energizing and inspiration and nurturing as well, so we can keep going back out into the world, as Mia uh, 
uh, challenged us to do. So um, this was a successful experience of co-writing a play with five women and five ethnicities and five different subjects related to the um, DREAM Act. Do you want to say something? I, I want to say something, but I'd rather hear you talk more about your many beautiful plays. But yes, this is, I think is such an important and timely project. Uh, Dream Act um, was based on interviews with uh, Dream Act eligible youth back in 2012. So we, the five women playwrights, interviewed various high school and college um, undocumented immigrant youth um, and then created together this play. And we did many readings and panels, uh, always uh, including an immigration lawyer and a dreamer who had the courage to join us and we always had at least one. Uh, and unfortunately, now it's again the time for a dream act. And uh, Jessica and her theater company will put on another stage reading soon. Yes, so. That, that's one success story only because we managed to, um, to do it together. Um, the project I wanted to talk about is, is called The Fear Project and it's something I've been involved with now for a couple of years and continue to um, look for opportunities to share it. Um, it came, I was working in the Czech Republic, I work a lot overseas, I work more overseas than I do in the United States, I work a lot in Palestine. Um, I work with the Freedom Theater, I work with some of the people we, we uh, introduced you to earlier. I uh, have Katrina and I both, and David actually, we've all been to Iraq and working there. Um, and uh, I work in Egypt, I work in Lebanon, and I work in, um, in, in the EU, and especially been working quite a bit in the Czech Republic. And when I was in the Czech Republic, I was amazed at all of the, the warmth of the people, but this deep racism for Roma, for the gypsy population, as well as this terror of, of Muslim uh, refugees when there aren't any. So it's terror of the unknown and the unseen. And I was working with a colleague, and I said, why is there so much hate? And he said, well, I'm in the basement. No, I'm not going to do an accent on the <laughs> But he said, in the basement of the hate, you will always find the fear. Mm. And it struck me that, that people are afraid. So I've now done this project in the Czech Republic. I was uh, financed by the, the US State Department, but prior to the uh, recent um, shift in uh, leaders. Uh, Obama uh, passed this uh, Arts Envoy um, project and I went for many, many weeks all over the Czech Republic and worked with various populations with this project. Um, we've done it with Artists Rise Up, we've done it at both La Mama and Dixon Place, I've done it in Milwaukee, I've done it in India and Calcutta, and David even used uh, the questions with um, some uh, students and youth uh, in, in Umbria last summer. So it is something that I think really works. And what it is, is we go, I, I get some collaborators wherever I am, and I ask them to interview as many people as they can with as much diversity, age diversity, ethnicity, um, uh, gender, sexual orientation, everything. And, uh, and we get as many interviews, some little children, some older people. And we ask 13 questions, and the questions are timed in a very specific way, so it's like a research project. All the interviews come to me, and I um, put them into a choral poem. So it's all verbatim text, but I make choices about, uh, you know, repetition, inclusion, exclusion, when uh, all the women will speak, when all the men will speak, when it's one voice, when it's all voices. And I come back to my collaborators, we read this out loud, and then I, uh, through a series, through discussions with the, with the performers and the community who's done the interviews, we brainstorm and improv and work on a, on a play. And the play always has three parts. Uh, one is the choral interviews, the other is what always happens to come out of these brainstorming sessions, which is a family scene. 
and then uh, monologues and supplemental scenes based on the situation. So in India, the supplemental scenes had to do with um, violence, gender violence in on public transportation. Uh, in, in the Czech Republic, because of this fear of refugees, we actually staged a, a refugee family crossing the water um, and the beating up of a, of a gypsy woman as supplemental scenes, but the, the uh, format is always the same. And then the most important part of the, of the experience for the audience is that the actors come in to the house when the audience is seated or even out in the lobby and with yellow paper, the yellow paper is important, they ask the same 13 questions to the audience and then they're embedded into the performance. So when the yellow papers come out, the audience kind of leans forward knowing that their answers are going to be there. Um, and so it's, an, it's a piece of art, but it is also a therapeutic process. And then right after the play is over, we don't even take a bow, we sit down and have a discussion with the audience, not about the play, but about the 13 questions. And the 13 questions are, what are you afraid of? Who are you afraid of? Where are you most afraid? What is your reaction to fear? How do you conquer fear? What is the enemy? Who is the enemy? Where is the enemy? How do you react to hate? How do you conquer hate? What is home? Who is the stranger? And how do you feel about your country right now? And with those questions, we, um, we create both a piece and an experience for the artists the interviewees and the audiences. Great, thanks. That, that, that's terrific. I think at this point, um, we can have more of a conversation amongst us if you have questions for each other, but uh, I guess the, the thing that was, that's, was intriguing to me about what everybody was talking about was the, the sort of two, challenge, two big challenges that I heard was, first of all, the sort of internal challenge of the artist to <coughs> understand what it is they want to um, bring forth and how to do that, and not only for themselves but for a company of our other artists that they're engaged with, and then this idea of who's the audience, who's listening to this, this, who's experiencing this piece of art, and how do we shift so that we can expand the audience, uh, you know, and, and change the audience, not speak to just the same people. So I don't know if anybody has any thoughts. I think this is a time where we can just share ideas and learn from each other a bit. If you have those, or other challenges that you want to bring up. Uh, I'll leave it open for her. Well, I'd like to say something because Jessica brought up collaboration. And I feel the same, although of course I was, I'm, I'm still writing my plays, but actually for the last five years, I wasn't able to write a new play in my own way. I was more involved in projects, in device theater projects that were responding to the needs of a community I was involved with. And as an um, uh, educator at Ithaca College, as a professor of um, playwriting and contemporary theater, I felt the need to respond to those issues. I created a device theater piece with my students on microaggressions on student campuses, starring Gerald Jerome, who also wrote spoken word for us. He is one of the actors in Moonlight, the Oscar-winning movie. Uh, so this kind of work felt more fulfilling. I feel that somehow our role as playwrights and artists at this time is to <laughs> go beyond our own individual needs of creating something. And it's hard because, of course, you want to do your own thing. But at this point, for me, uh, it's more important to collaborate with other playwrights, uh, to create projects like Dream Acts, based on interviews with Dream Act eligible youth, to create projects on microaggressions, on veterans coming back from different wars. I feel it's such an uh, important moment here in the US, and I'm sorry that it's so similar to the totalitarian regime in Romania, <laughs> somehow. <laughs> For, for me, I mean, I wish I, I couldn't see those similarities, but I feel there is again, for me, as an artist, uh, there is a need to respond as an artist and to uh, find new projects that represent uh, the community and the artist's uh, um, fight with the system. Uh, that I think that we as artists, again, need to be subverting the system, challenging the system, interrogating the system, and raising the important questions of the moment. So do you think that, uh, and as 
the rest of you, do you think that at, at this particular time uh, that uh, the sort of activism side of art is uh, is what's driving you, or is there is it something else? Do you, is it you feel like there's more energy around doing uh, something that's more overtly either political or? It's the only thing driving me now. <laughs> it's, I mean, that's what I say. I think that I feel like with, with Martha, listening to your music, you've got to hear this woman sing. You will. Um, but uh, she, but that, that transcends so much for me uh, in a way that sometimes theater doesn't. That, that music reaches across things, and I'm just grateful to you for, for having your voice. And um, I think we also need humor to, to transcend this. Katrina and I, um, for a long time, worked with an agent that was um, a chihuahua, and we kept that going for a long time because it's hard. It's hard out there, and we had to really work with this chihuahua to represent us in, a, in an appropriate way as karaoke singers, which we, um, we started a, <laughs> a bit of keeping our social sense of justice karaoke. social justice karaoke, um, <laughs> represented by a chihuahua, and then we fired the chihuahua and got a parrot. But I think that we we have to come together and buoy each other and um, and laugh a little bit. Um, I feel um, you know with regard to activism, sometimes and you know maybe it's just me, but I, and maybe my friends. <laughs> but I always feel that people of color are born activists. <laughs> you know we're. We're in a colonized society. We're in the USA. And the current administration is a reflection of everything that we are against just by this. You know, there have been laws put in place for centuries just because they don't see us as human. Um, so we have a lot of retraining to do. They see that our ways are, are savage. Um, we were property and labor and imprisoned on many different levels. So when you think about where we are today in 2018, you know, even as a, as a woman as well, property, same thing. Um, I think that we have no choice. I think that um, there have been many people who have been able to assimilate and, you know, kind of pass through those laws, you know, and there's the business of that, the business of whiteness and that kind of thing. But um, what has happened is this has, you know, what's been going on with this current administration has been a real wake up call to how complacent um, people who have have been passing, have gotten, everybody thought they were in, and then all of a sudden, it was like, well, hold on, this is everything that we're against. You know, and then holiday uh, dinners with relatives have highlighted a lot of stuff in these families. They haven't highlighted it in my family because we're broken black, <laughs> you know? And so, um, but it's really an interesting time and the women that I've known who are, who are not women of color, who are white women and men who do not believe in this, this is really important that they, you know, they are saying, wait a minute, we are not like this a-hole who's in charge of this country. We are nothing like that, and we have to get together and make that known. And, and so for the first time in a really, really long time, um, I feel a solidarity that I had never felt before. And, um, you know, I thought my, my parents marched for all this stuff. I thought that we had, you know, gone past that and they created this beautiful world for us to be, you know, artists. And, um, and here we are right back in fighting again. But I'm, I'm ready for it. We've been fighting for 500 years, so this is nothing for us. So. I just wanted to piggyback uh, on this thing that I had heard about with uh, the new Jim Crow Michelle Alexander's book not being allowed in, in prisons. And I know Penn is going to speak. 
is someone from Penn yeah. going to speak? Because I know Penn has been involved in, in that issue and it just seems like another insanity. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on what's been said, um, in particular by you, Martha, and, and think about, you know, yes, as people of color, we've always been activists, and also that we are the living survivors of genocide, um, and that places us in a very particular um, zone where that spectrum of what it means to be activists varies from um, the young man at the school where I'm in residence, uh, Borum Hill School for International Studies in Brooklyn, shout outs, uh, who uh, walks around with his Bluetooth headphones, like in the hallways, wailing. Like what he's doing is not, he's not like rapping along, he's like wailing. Um, and even with the proliferation of what some disparagingly call mumble rap, I don't know if anyone in this room is involved in that conversation, but uh, there's been this kind of mourning of the, the death of like rap as rap, where you can actually hear d the differences in the words, like between words, like, uh, and mumble rap is, you know, that it's all this one, and I, I say too, it's all this one kind of wail, um, which is interesting because you're talking about sound and the way that sound is the thing that is piercing through this time. Um, and so like to all the hip hop purists that hate me now, uh, I just, <laughs> I, I think that there are these really beautiful and fascinating aesthetic interventions that are themselves um, resistant. And also um, it's our job as artists to help focus, drive and organize those in a way that they can be more widely understood and put to use towards our liberation. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't know, uh, I, I've, always, I've always felt the drive, the activist drive, and so um, my own creative work has been slower because I'm constantly both making work and making space for my people to make work, um, and that's hard. Um, so I'm also, I wear a bunch of hats. Another hat I wear is I'm an assistant professor in the program of Theater and Performance of the Americas. It's a PhD program at Arizona State University. Um, I'm in residence this year at um, New York Theater Workshop as a 2050 fellow and at Warren Hill School for International Studies doing work with restorative justice and theater um, in Brooklyn. And, um, you know, I don't really sleep a lot, <laughs> you know? Uh, I think, so I, I think that um, and I'm, all, I'm, I'm making a work, I'm building a work, and the work feels very, very important to me. Uh, and I'm not like ready to give that up, and I'm also like staying up all night, like writing grants to get space for more of us to do more things. So it's like this, um, uh, I believe in abundance, and society believes in deficit, and it feels like um, sometimes you're a hamster on a wheel. Um, and so I'm really excited for the conversation today just to be in the room and to feel uh, feel preached to <laughs> but also to um, to kind of demand and, and request and ask that as as people invested in theater and resistance that we really think seriously about um, the democratization of leadership in uh, our theater world, such that um, uh, the, the really deep support of uh, artists from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, and what I mean by deep support is that uh, there's a lot of stuff for emerging artists, and then after that, it kind of drops off once you've done some things, <laughs> you know? Um, I think also, I mean, I think my mom is an incredible model, but like so much more of that. Um, performance in the Borderlands is also an amazing model at ASU. We have an incredible cultural institution called Performance in the Borderlands. But uh, you guys can look it up, I'm not gonna talk about it, but uh, really good work coming out of there as well. Um, 
But yeah, I think um, more ways to make relationships and, and funding around that. And um, I think, and my hope too, is that with um, the fact that now kind of like everybody is in on the conversation of how fucked up like capitalism and heteropatriarchy is, um, white supremacy, like now that everybody's like, now that we're all like on the same page, um, that maybe the money can follow that, like the resources, right, can follow that knowledge. I think that's a super big shift that we are in the, like that has the potential of happening in this particular socio-historical moment, and that's exciting to me, um, and to be in community, in deeper community, um, in a way that I think as a country we haven't had, and as a result, as a world, because as a country, US, right, has been fucking up community for mad long. Um, so as a, as a country, and thus as like an international community, um, there's a lot more potential. Yeah, and we have, just, so you, we have like four minutes. I just want to ask if you um, feel like, um, you, you mentioned this positive aspect of, of this horrible political <laughs> environment is that artists are coming together. Do you feel um, that, and this is for anyone, but do you feel that you, that you feel an urgency now, or, or more of an urgency, or less of an urgency to get, to get the word out? And I feel, um, I think it depends on the day. <laughs> yeah. I think sometimes I feel more like pulling the covers over my head than ever. Um, and especially uh, doing such close work with youth, as many of us know, can be so heartbreaking and overwhelming. Um, and I also feel that sense of, yeah, I, I feel the paradox of the sense of urgency. So we have, uh, unfortunately, this is a very little time lapse going by so quickly. Um, was, I think, thank you for like, uh, you know, speaking to everybody and letting kind of people know what you know what they can do or what you encourage them to do. And I wonder if everybody could take just a moment to, what would you like to say to uh, other the people in this room? Are some of the leaders, artists, activists, uh, people that are doing the work, and other people are trying to figure out how to do the work, uh, how to get into it. What what would Final thing might you uh, want to say to everybody at this point, just to, uh, um, and whatever you have to say to them. I really like what that first guy said, I can't remember his name, that you need to be a little crazy to do something that's relevant and subversive and challenging. But yes, try to discover or nurture that positive craziness in yourself and others and do things that, that challenge the system, I would say, and challenge the people to think in a different way, maybe, than they are used to. Okay, thanks. Uh, Kat? Um, could we take a question or something from the audience? We're gonna have a chance to do that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I find it very useful to brainstorm with people that I know and, and just talk to people about what they're doing and how they have done what they achieved, so I'm hoping that we can do more of that when we have the discussions. Yeah, we will, I promise. <laughs> Martha, is there anything you want to add? Yes, I, I wanted to say, um, even though, um, you know, we, we talked about, you know, uh, the things that we, the disgusting things that have been going on in our government, but for me, you know, when, when times are really awful, it's a good time for art, and I believe, I feel very hopeful, and I believe that, strongly believe that all we're really doing is reassembling our own power and recognizing what's been there for us to go for. And so I think mobilizing as we are globally um, is the way forward, and, I, and it's happening. It's, it's already happening, it's already in place, and we just have to, um, not be kind of uh, knocked back by the, the idiocy of, and the pettiness of uh, what's happening in, in the media and this fear mongering and things that they're kind of throwing at us and we just keep our eyes on the prize and get this right. And that's what we're doing, you know, and, and so I feel really good about um, what's to come, all good things to come. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Jess? Um, <clears throat> well, I just want to go back to Issa at the beginning because Issa is often an example 
uh, to me, and often we, uh, David and I, when we teach workshops in peace building and performance, we use this exercise called Big Ass Idea, and we ask people to come up with a big ass idea for changing the world with art that, that could not happen probably, but we're gonna do it, and I've had amazing, um, people come up with amazing things that aren't censored by financial worries or um, political correctness, just, I wanna have a, a room that you walk into and you only know one language and when you walk out you know all the languages and we think, oh, that's impossible and then we, we initiate a kind of uh, Amish barn raising and figure out how we can move that crazy idea a little closer. And we got the idea from Issa who built a radio tower in the middle of the jungle, which is now transmitting, uh, which we raised $21,000 for on uh, Kickstarter and now is, is Creating, we're having, a, we're starting a radio theater taboo. Um, so, but um, that was a crazy, big ass idea, and, uh, and we should be inspired by that. Unfortunately, we have to uh, close this conversation in this format for right now. But I hope that you all take an opportunity to uh, continue the conversation. I think there's. Uh, a lot more to be mined from uh, all, everything that's been said, and uh, we'd love to hear, of course, what you all have to say as well, which we'll get to in the next section. So uh, please join me in thanking all these wonderful artists. You guys are all really patient to do a lot of listening. If you want to stand up briefly, stretch, yes. sit right back down. Um, so our thought, there's a lot of big ideas going on um, that have been broadcast here. Um, the next 45 minutes, we're going to do three short sessions where colleagues that we all have worked with uh, are going to address specific topics that are of major concern to society at large. Uh, there, we're going to have a session on diversity, a session on arts rights and mobility, and a session on climate change and sustainability. So the idea with each of these is a couple of people are going to come up who are, have a really deep knowledge and have worked intensely with these fields to kind of do a, an abrupt download of the thoughts and the topics uh, that are that, that make up those conversations right now. I've asked them all to think, you. if you had 15 minutes to give an arts organization or a theater group advice about how to be more sustainable or how to address issues of, uh, of climate change, or I'm a theater group, I'm concerned about how we're related to the topic of, of diversity in my community, how do we address that? So, the point of these next brief sessions is to kind of give you some elevator pitch about how to address these topics. Um, so, uh, the first, uh, I'd like to ask up to come up to the stage, uh, uh, Nisha Sajnaji, Saj I'm sorry, Sajnaji. Naji. That's it. That's the one. I really practiced this so long before, and it just totally didn't work. Um, and Amelia, uh, this is also a tough one. You're going to do it for me. That's it. That's it. Okay. I'd like the, the two of you to come up, and uh, we've got about 20 minutes to dive into the topic of diversity. Amelia uh, is the director of the, the Theater Communications Group, uh, Artists and International Program. She oversees TCG's grant programs, international programs, and special projects, including Beyond Orientalism, a national initiative to address the use, the use of yellow face, brown face, and whitewashing. Uh, Nisha is the director of the Drama Therapy, Therapy Program at NYU. Uh, in this position, she teaches an introductory course in drama therapy, theater aesthetic, and therapeutic theater, arts-based research with a focus on embodied and performance research and advanced research methods. Um, actually, I love to stand, so uh, I'm going to be here. 
again, because um, I want to be able to look at my notes, my cheat sheet here. Uh, so good morning, you all. Uh, thank you for being here, and thanks to everybody that worked on this. Frank here at the Siegel Center, folks at Theater Without Borders. Um, really great to be in the room with you all. And uh, I know that Mia uh, earlier invoked the name of Ellen, Ellen Stewart, and I wanted to just bring a couple of other names in the room because I think, uh, I believe in the spiritual plane, and I think uh, these folks are with us here today. So uh, Ellen Stewart, uh, Martha Coignet, who is in instrumental in really uh, moving international work forward, um, and someone who influenced me greatly, uh, Grace Lee Boggs, who is a Chinese-American activist, feminist, writer, uh, and mentor, and so I was so blessed to have had them all in my life. Um, I'm not an expert, uh, but I want to share uh, some learnings from working in this field for more than 30 years in the performing arts and from lived experience as a person of color, a woman of color. Uh, it's a great room of activists. I think there are a lot of you all, pretty much everybody here thinks about this a lot, as I do. Uh, and I'm hoping that there may be some bits and bobs, some little thoughts that may be new to you, uh, or that you want to dig deeper, or uh, if you've thoroughly uh, explored it, then right on. Um, I'd like to actually know a little bit about you. It would help me just as I maybe shift and shape where I'm going to uh, talk about a little bit. Uh, so I want to uh, ask a series of prompts. And if you're able, uh, I would love you to respond by raising your hand. And uh, I ask that you only um, raise your hand to one of the answers in the prompts. Uh, so you have to make some choices. Um, and uh, I think what's also interesting is to, we're not really sitting in a circle, uh, but in addition to your response to the question, to see the responses of others in the room, right? So does, does that make sense? Uh, very straightforward. Uh, so practice round, actually, let's try this. Um, I usually arrive early, late, or just on time. Early, ooh, impressive, uh, late, just on time. Ah, yes. Okay, practice ready. Uh, I identify as white, a person of color, mixed race. White, person of color, mixed race. Okay, great. I, I identify as male, female, non-binary. Male, female, non-binary. Right? Uh, I identify as early career, mid-career, or veteran. Early career, mid-career, self-defined, right? Veteran. <laughs> okay. Um, I identify as a theater maker, producer, presenter. Theater maker, producer, presenter. Interesting, not so many. I thought there would be more y'all. Um, I live in the US. Yes, no. I live in the US. Yes, no. Ah, I also thought there would be more from out of country. Okay. Um, English is my primary language. Yes, no. Yes, no. Ah, okay. Uh, I practice the religion faith that I was born into. Yes? No. <laughs> I live in the country where I was born. Yes? No. Okay. Uh, where are you on the continuum of fluency around equity, diversity, and inclusion? Early stages, deep in the work. Early stages, deep in the work. Uh, when highly emotional conversations about race come up in my theater work, I feel vulnerable, prepared, overwhelmed, hopeful. Vulnerable, overwhelmed, 
Prepared, hopeful. Ah, a lot of hope in the room, that is good. Uh, our theaters, uh, yours, uh, your theater's executive leadership is a woman and or a person of color, yes, no. Your theater organization's executive leadership is a woman and or a person of color, yes? Hmm. No. Oh, all right. Um, our theater's board is 51% women and or people of color. Our theater's board is 51% women and or theater of color, yes? No. Or maybe don't know. Hmm? Okay. Um, who has the most power? Theater leaders or community? Theater leaders? <laughs> community. Okay. Um, and I identify as a critical race theorist. Yes? No. Yes? No. Good, thank you. Uh, and, and just me identifying as a critical race theorist, um, I, it's not that and now you can go to theater programs and actually get degrees in these things, which is like incredible. Uh, but I actually, just a short bit about me, I came out of um, 19, November 6, 1969, was the uh, student strike at San Francisco State University that launched the School of Ethnic Studies uh, and a lot of student activism during that time. Uh, and so I'm very much a product of that. Um, so that's my perspective. So given all that and the hand raising, um, great that you played along, thank you so much. Um, I actually don't want to talk about diversity. I don't. It's not enough, right? Uh, since the 80s, diversity programs have been funded, have been implemented, and have failed. And I believe largely because they haven't addressed the crucial issue of systemic structural racism in this country, right? Racism is defined as the systematic and intentional oppression of a group of people from the ruling class and its agents. Only those with the most power can be racist. Racism shows up in so many structures, education, health, finance, housing, not-for-profit organizations, voting, unions was mentioned earlier. Some of you may be uh, familiar with the civil rights advocate and scholar thinker Kimberly Crenshaw. Anybody read her work, Kimberly Crenshaw? All right, if you haven't, read her. Uh, she's credited with developing intersectional theory, the study of how overlapping or intersecting social identities relate to structures and systems of oppression or discrimination. Uh, in, in addition to race, ethnicity, other identities include gender, sexual orientation, class, religion, ability, disability, age, citizenship and immigration status, language, education, and, and some others, right? And while there's oppression specifically connected to these other identities, I believe the true liberation will never come until there is racial equity. Those with the most power in this country are US born, native English speaking, cisgender, white Christian males between 45 to 65 years old without neural or physical disabilities. Right? I'm US born, native English speaking, cisgendered, confirmed Catholic but lapsed, uh, college educated, between 45 and 65, you can do the math, uh, but I'm Filipino and I have mobility issues. So I'm very privileged, but I'm not the most powerful. In fact, actually, Filipinos, uh, a lot of you may not know this, that um, uh, Filipinos came here originally as slaves on Spanish armadas uh, and landed in New Orleans, uh, were lynched and rioted against uh, in California. Um, and I'm not at all saying that uh, we were as oppressed as uh, the black community in slavery, but I just bring that up to show that uh, the, the, the spread of racism in this country and how it affected many, many communities. 
Okay, so where did the idea of race come from? Right? Race is based actually on a false science. It was rooted in Europe during the Middle Ages when the known world was only Europe, Africa, and the Near East. So thus the invention of Caucasian, Mongoloid, Negroid. Australoid, which is the fourth race, came later. Actually, my people Filipino, we're Australoid. Uh, I will politically identify as an Asian American, but in my DNA, and if we're looking specifically at race, I am Austro Australoid. My, my DNA is Australoid. Um, in the 17 and 1800s, Swedish, Dutch, and German scientists uh, used skin, hair, uh, jaw width, frontal lobe, um, skin color, and even actually body lice uh, to determine race. So today's scientists consider this a false science. In fact, actually, the UN stopped using race as an identifier in the 1950s and instead used more than 5,000 plus uh, ethnic groupings as identifiers. More accurate. Uh, but race, as a social construct, continues to impact our everyday lives. Uh, since 2002, more than 2 million people have logged into Project Implicit. It's a website run by Harvard University. Has anyone here in the room done the... Um, yeah, it's a great test. If you haven't, go to that. It's, it's just eye-opening. Um, so this implicit association test, it's a rapid response task which measures how easily you can pair items from different categories. Right? This tests for implicit bias rather than conscious racism. Um, a version of the test presents white or black faces and um, uh, and positive or negative words. So if you're taking the test, your task is to really quickly sort through faces as either African American or European American, while at the same time you're sorting a variety of words, happy, sad, agony, joy, right? Um, and you're sorting those words as either good or bad. Now the results showed that people were much faster in sorting when black faces were paired with bad words and faster in sorting uh, when white faces were paired with good words. And when the results were mapped, uh, they showed that white people in every US state uh, was biased against blacks, everywhere from north to south, Maine to California, liberals to conservatives, uh, men to women, young to old. So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, I've seen many situations where an arts organization hires a person of color or two in a lower rung position and then the organization rests. Uh, there have been recent studies of staff in arts organizations where there are very high numbers of people of color in museums, on museum staffs, but when you drill deeper, those positions are security guards and receptionists, not leadership. Uh, there are people of color on theater staff, but still the number of artistic directors of color at Lord Theaters, League of Resident Theaters, is stunningly low, four out of 72. Women dominate the smaller theaters as artistic leaders, but far fewer lead mid and larger budget sized theaters. And many theaters consider their boards diverse, but a recent TCG survey showed that boards are still 89% white male. So theaters are congratulating themselves on diversity in programming, but the decision makers are not diverse, right? Uh, the term minority is inaccurate. 85% of the global population are people of color. A good friend of mine is lobbying um, to start using people of the global majority rather than people of color. <laughs> yeah. So I know that um, I'm, uh, the time sign thing is getting flashed. So I'm gonna leave you with just a, a couple of things. I'm gonna kind of skip to the end. Unfortunately, I can't hang out with you for the rest of it, the juicy conversation. I'm actually going to talk to um, Norwegian artists at the Norwegian <laughs> Council. <laughs> Which I think is gonna be a really interesting conversation. <laughs> so, uh, some things to, to think about.
about moving forward. So invest time and resources in anti-racism training, not just equity, diversity, and inclusion training, but anti-racism training for you and your organization. Hire women and people of color in decision-making positions and increase the number of women of people of color in your board. Practice equitable partnerships. If you're working with community organizations, make sure that everyone has the same opportunity and the same financial resources. Conduct a racial equity audit of your organization, your company, to see how intention aligns up with actual practice. Learn the history of local communities of color and develop relationships with their leaders. Use inclusive and welcoming language in your external communications. Uh, there's a lot of change within the funding community, and I'm also a re-grantor, so if you want to have that conversation, you could email me separately. So change takes work, clearly, right? I want to leave you with some questions to explore in your discussions that you're going to have in a little bit. So what is more important, intention or action? As a theater maker, my priority is safety or action. Are the arts best when they unite or disrupt? The end result of empathy must be acceptance or activism. So think about what you want to change, tell someone, and publicly inform it. Thanks so very much. so much for that. That was amazing, Amelia. Um, Misha? Okay. I don't know what remains to be said after me, really. I apologize a bit for my voice. If I come in and out, still getting over whatever bug seems to be going around. So we were, we were planning um, how to approach the conversation uh, today, and I was thinking about how I might speak about diversity, equity, inclusion, and dignity, anti-oppression within the context of higher education, where we typically will look at these issues through the lens of recruitment and retention, content and casting, whose stories, which bodies are being privileged. But instead, I think I'm going to take you inside the process of inclusivity, the process of cultivating and creating so psychological and social bravery, a sense of dignity and inclusion, inside the process of theater making itself, in uh, through a, a focus on our series at NYU, again, thinking about how we leverage the spaces and the resources we have in higher education. I'm going to focus in on a project that we've been doing since 2011 uh, in the drama therapy department. Um, drama therapy has been referenced a few times in this conversation. I teach on theater and health. So when we think about drama therapy, we're thinking about how does improvisation and performance facilitate psychological and social health across the spectrum. So inside this, in, inside this series, which has been going on since 2011, I'm checking in with my colleague, um, Leo Hamarska, during the front row. One of the first things that we're doing, of course, is um, we're engaging with communities, again, with that ethos of shared authority, of, of cultivating true and equitable partnerships, bringing them into a space or going out into their space, for example, uh, just recently working with the uh, Hebrew residents, with uh, older adults, working in their spaces and also in our NYU spaces to look at the kinds of stories that they want to tell. But before we even get to making stories and creating work together, we're using improvisation, play, uh, all the full range of different kinds of techniques, sociodrama, developmental transformations, theater of the oppressed, to address the emotional terrain of oppression the emotional terrain of suffering, the emotional terrain of white supremacy. So we're looking at how do we um, wake up from this um, anesthetized space that we're in to address the fear and the anxiety, the, the scars of neglect, uh, the distress, the nightmares that remain in our bodies as a result of the experiences that we've lived. And many of you who do devise theater and work with groups in your classrooms or in community know that in the beginning you are cultivating ensemble, you are creating a sense of inclusivity, a, a society in and of itself where people can find their voice, uh, feel freed up to tell their stories. 
and, and then the next phase comes along where people are stitching together a narrative. It's more of a cognitive process where you're taking what's arisen from the body and moving it into a story language. Uh, again, my assumption here, and in the work that we do, we're working with people who are living the stories themselves. Katie had spoken to this uh, earlier. So we do work with pro uh, professional playwrights as well to help shape stories and give them the strong aesthetic uh, structure. Uh, but this phase involves taking all of that residue, the remains that arise out of the playmaking process, the, the play itself, and moving it into a story language. And then finally, so how do we take private experiences, experiences of shame and stigma, and move them into public space? Uh, how do we prepare groups to do that? Uh, so, of course, working with groups that are not used to doing this, this will obviously involve a lot of um, uh, again, risk and repetition to be able to prepare themselves to bring their stories to an audience. And the questions, the questions that we negotiate at that stage of the work is which audience? In drama therapy, we tend to focus on the closest audiences. We think about your brothers and your sisters, your cousins, your family members, the communities in which you live. Often those are the riskiest audiences to present our stories to. And those are often the first audiences that we start with in our work before opening it up to a public, um, more public audience. So I've got a time marker here. I think I'll, I'll just wrap it up by saying that those are some of the ways that we go about cultivating psychological and social bravery, which I think is that space between safety and activism. I don't remember quite the binary that Amelia proposed. She proposed quite a bit. I'll end there. Thank you. Again, moving right along quickly here, uh, we'd like to turn our attention from uh, diversity to climate and sustainability. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Julia Levine and Chantal uh, Villadeau to the stage. Um, Julia is a playwright, a creative collaborator, and she is uh, a marketing team of here, producing team of the International Human Rights Arts Festival, and the organizing team for Climate Change Theater Action and writes a blog called Artists and Climate Change. Uh, Chantal is a playwright and a translator whose work explores the intersection of science, policy, art, and climate change. She is the artistic director of the Arctic Cir Cycle and the founder of a blog and international network <coughs> of artists and climate change and is co-founder of Climate Change Theater Action. Um, change included in this um, gathering because it's, uh, in my experience, when we talk about the arts and climate change, it's something that's very marginalized and um, that we sort of, um, there's all the big things we do in the theater and then the climate change is to the side, so I'm happy to be part of this. Um, how can theater be part of a global solution to climate change? And uh, in order to answer this question, I'm going to define climate change as a set of unsustainable systems, economic, political, environmental, and cultural, that harm other creatures and undermine our ability to survive as a species. So I want to uh, make it clear that we're not talking just about nature, and it's not about hugging trees, although if you've never hugged a tree, I would highly suggest you try. <laughs> Sometimes they hug you back. Um, but I'm talking about a very holistic view of um, the systems that we have and uh, I'm putting everybody in the same boat. So um, how can theater be part of a global solution to climate change? I think we have to look at two things. The first one is content. What do we have in our plays, in our shows, of, um, and what we're putting on stage? What are the stories we're telling? Um, how big are these stories? and who is at the center of these stories, which is, um, who's at the center is something I think everybody has talk, addressed in one way or another um, this far in this conference. Um, but how, how big are our stories? We are used to thinking in very small um, 
timelines and the length of a human life or sometimes of a few generations, but we don't think, we don't think in, time, in terms of deep time. So what would that mean if we try to shift our thinking in the way we write the, our plays? Like, what would it mean to put deep time on stage? What would that look like? Also, what does complexity and interconnected interconnectedness look like on stage? These are two um, defining elements of climate change that we hear over and over again. It's a really complex problem that's global, and it's um, all the more complex because we're all interconnected now. We can't separate um, a country from another. We can't separate an environment, a natural and an environment from another. We have to think about all these things together. Um, and finally, how can we shift from reacting to imagining? A lot of the theater is reactive. We're responding to what's going on ahead of us, and that's uh, certainly valid and necessary. But can we take another step and start imagining what can be, what can come next? Like, how can we, we the artists, the creative people, start to paint the picture? For the people who are, for the politicians, the politicians, for the um, the business uh, people who are creating all the new technologies, like what can we put forward? The type of worlds we want to live in that may help people who actually make that world happen have a better idea of where to go. Um, and also, in addition to what's in the stories, in our stories, how do we tell those stories? Climate change goes hand in hand with hand in hand with imperialism, abuses of power, racism, and discrimination. So, um, how does the construction of a story uh, reflect a worldview? And are we, regardless of what we're saying in the play, the way we're saying it is it consistent with what we want to create? Um, are the building blocks that we're using still relevant? Is the way we tell stories sustainable? And I mean that as much as um, who and what we're putting on stage. Who is getting paid? Um, who is making the decisions? What are the power structures at play in a production? And I'm going to pass it on to Julia, but I want to say in New York City, there are some very good companies that are doing work at that, that intersection. And those include, um, and some of you may know them already, Superhero Clubhouse. Upstream's art, uh, Upstream Artists Collective, they're in Brooklyn, and uh, The Anthropologists. Thank you. Thanks, jean for really breezing through what is the tip of the iceberg. I look forward to continuing conversations throughout the day. Um, so I'm going to talk about a specific initiative that Chantal and some others in this room co-founded called Climate Change Theater Action. And it's a worldwide series of readings and performances uh, about climate change presented by, Enne by Ennio Lee to coincide with the UN Conference of the Parties. So the last climate change theater action happened this past fall, 2017, um, and the plays come from a commission, Chantal commissions 50 playwrights from all over the world to write a five minute play about a climate topic, and for 2017, the guiding question or prompt for these playwrights was, how can we turn the challenges of climate change into opportunities? And so this year, from those plays that we saw that um, were opportunities for playwrights to take risks because um, it's within a five minute time and um, it's not up to the playwrights to find producers or um, collaborators, that's what uh, comes in the next step. So these plays, uh, the collection of 50 are available online and Chantal and I um, and our collaborators reached out to universities, individuals, theater companies, other types of organizations to um, create an event one night or a series of events that use at least one of these 50 plays and um, this year especially we focused on uh, and encouraged the collaborators to include at least one action um, with their event, so that could range from um, raising money, writing legislators, or public demonstrations. Um, and you can find more on the website, climatechangetheateraction.com. There's a um, whole diversity of uh, images that came from this year's action. Um, 
and from the feedback of our participants and collaborators and the playwrights, we um, came across uh, the ideas from what climate change theater action can do, um, which touched on a lot of what we've been covering today and that have come up in that um, this initiative is particip participatory. It involves the playwrights from that initial seed of the play through to audiences and conversations and speakers from local organizations. Um, so it really is concentric, the, the circles that this initiative can spill out into. Um, it crosses disciplines. Uh, one example we had from Arizona State University was that their theater department selected plays, three plays, and paired each play with a scientist, um, an expert on those issues that each of the plays were covering. Um, it builds local and global communities so that um, these events in that they happen right where the collaborators are, um, but also we're connected online through our networks. Um, people feel part of a larger whole. Um, for people who are doing events in communities where climate change is not part of the discourse, this was affirming to say that, okay, here's an individual at a college in Montana who um, comes from a community that is impacted by climate change but doesn't have an outlet to talk about it. Climate change theater action helps to amplify um, those conversations um, and also provides a point of, en point of ent entry. Um, so breaking down this large topic and issue of climate change through the plays, uh, the plays are so diverse in that they're from countries all over the world. So um, there's really something for everyone to tap into, to think, okay, I'm interested in um, evolution and, and where people come from. So there, Chantal's play, Homo Sapiens, um, touches on that topic under the climate change umbrella. Um, and also, um, point of entry in that climate change theater action is a model. It sets up resources and tools for people to use and build their own event like a choose your own adventure. Um, and also, uh, ultimately, I think for me, what is really amazing and inspiring um, coming from all these events that we've seen from the uh, seven weeks of the action is the hope that is generated um, and the momentum so that, yes, the initiative coincides with Conference of the Parties. That was huge in 2015 when the initiative was inaugural. Um, but now, where we're at in 2017, looking into 2019 when the next action will happen, how can we link the momentum that was sparked from one event in one place and have um, a hub to support and buoy um, future conversations <coughs> more action um, and community discussions that come from the communities that are going to be most affected by climate change. sustainability, which is also really important, um, but not my uh, expertise. Um, so I encourage you, if you're interested in sustainability, sort of behind the scene, to look at uh, uh, organizations like Broadway Green Alliance, which is doing excellent work, Materials for the Art here in uh, New York. Um, online you can find a Green Theatre Toolkit, which was created by uh, Morde, now defunct, uh, Mordello Performing Arts Company. And um, Julie's Bicycle in the UK is also doing some really great work um, to green the art sector. Thank you. Okay, we're almost done with this sprint of marathons. Um, or marathon of sprints, I guess. Um, the the last brief deep dive, such as it is, uh, I'd like to invite Julie Triple from Penn to come up and join me. And we're going to spend a couple minutes talking about arts rights and mobility. Uh, when we spoke about this, when we were talking about this initially, just come on up here. There we go. Uh, we tried to figure out because these are topics that have to do with the uh, the supporting doc, the supporting systems for the arts, um, not just for theater, but across the across the disciplines, um, and we are.
initial thought was to kind of break it down into three different types of activism that we see and that we think about. Um, there's that work that you do, which we call Keep Arting, uh, which is basically the idea of trying to find ways that supporting organizations like Penn or like Thomas Doc can do to try to keep the status quo, to make sure that the powers that be don't stop us from what we were doing all along. Then there's the notion of resisting from within, uh, pushing back against, uh, you know, working within the system to make changes, advocacy work, and obviously does a lot of that kind of work in Thomas Beth as well, working within the systems of power to try to change from inside. And of course the last one, which is what has been largely talked about today, but that's the notion of resistance and protesting. Um, so as we think about the work that Penn does and that Thomas Duff does as well, we're thinking about those three broad topics and we're also thinking about how they affect what goes on in the US, but also how the, the knock-on effects of what we do in the US uh, affects the rest of the world. Um, do you want to jump in here? Let's jump in. Um, thank you, thank you Matt, thank you Jessica for inviting me and thank you for all these inspiring uh, uh, comments and ideas you have shared uh, so far this morning. So, just to give you an idea, um, in 2015, there were more than a thousand attacks on artists. It's doubled the number in 2015. So clearly, art and artists are under attack around the world. So the, the project I'm, I'm leading for Pan America is um, a global platform, a hub, we have heard this word several times today, a very collaborative platform to help and ensure that artists can live and can work everywhere uh, without fear. So um, Keep Arting is really at the core of this project. It's really to bring um, all the resources of Theatre Without Border and Canada as part of this uh, big um, network where we provide in kind of one website all the resources for the artist who are in danger. Like, what should I do? I am in Burundi and I am got kicked out of my house. The police is following me. So we provide um, connection because the project is named Artists at Risk Connection. We are connector, we are amplifier, and we try as much as we can to um, to connect artists who are in dire need with the organization that can support them. Um, so when we, we, we start planning this talk with um, Matt, we were like, let's look at US and the world. And I have to tell you really honestly, I started this project a year ago and we really launched publicly three months ago. I was not planning to work on US domestic issues. <laughs> and it's, um, I had to say we were thinking that, okay, censorship exists in the US, we have our problem, but compared to other regime, we were kind of not really looking at, at domestic issue. And I can see that you all noticed how Pan America kind of shift since the election to really like US advocacy. And I mean, we are keeping up night, you know, since like a year, this year feel like 10 years. Um, and um, and we can see the effect of you know this type of collaboration. So what we seek to keep arting is we need to collaborate. Um, artists need a platform. Uh, artists that need to continue to create. They are the disruptive voices. We were talking about disruption and 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 engaging. engaging. And I think disruptive is their voice for the artists at risk. That's why they are at risk. Um, so to continue with that, um, your your um, um, uh, a number of years ago, I was in conversation with some of the folks at the National Endowment for the Arts, and they were really frustrated. This is in the last regime. They were really frustrated because mm -hmm. they were putting a lot of money into artistic performances, uh, supporting presenters who were bringing artistic performances internationally, <coughs> taxpayer money going to this work, and then of course homeland security making sure that those artists never actually entered the U.S. The NEA thought this was kind of frustrating, um, and we worked together uh, to start a project called uh, Thomas Duff Vale, which is a pro bono 
legal assistance hotline. All of you should already know about this, but if you don't, it's a hotline, email and telephone number where you can call with your artist visa issue problem and get 24 hour legal assistance for free. That's a thing that's out there. Um, and we bring it up now, not because it is something to talk about, but the, the it's a, the confluence of, in this case, the legal community and the arts community, which is the kind of thing that uh, is the institutional support that I think as we, as we gear toward increasingly activistic or activist uh, artistic praxis, figuring out how to create those coalitions across with other professions where we need those kinds of institutional support I think is really critical. Um, that's, and the other thing which was really important to me about this project is the fact that it was funded by the NEA, which doesn't mean that much to people in the US, maybe, because uh, we could just say, well, with their 40 bucks they've got to spend. But I think outside the US, it means a lot to people to realize, wait a minute, the US government is helping or helping people figure out how to get through this mess that the US government created. That's very cool. <laughs> um, because it creates, a, it creates the image that this isn't a monolithic, horrible place. There's actually a lot of complexity to what's going on here right now. As I think it is also um, worth note that this project that, had, um, that we are where we just finished <coughs> on is funded by the Menon Foundation, where you know we know that the Menon has been uh, a wonderful funder for large um, art institution, and we could see also a shift like we really want to go on arts rights and protect artists, the maker, not only the presenter, but, but the one who are making the work. So yeah. we can see that too. And I think the other thing that both our, our, our organizations have been very involved with is the idea of advocacy within the system. Uh, one thing that Thomas and I are working a lot with is, again, working within the legal community to evaluate and review all the laws that are impacting <coughs> artists' visa issues. And we've just published a 50-page paper, which is staggeringly boring to read, but it's <laughs> deep it's important. It's a really, really detailed evaluation of where all the problems come. Everybody knows that shows get canceled because people can't get visas. But there's actually a handful of very specific, probably about 50 very specific administrative things that go wrong. And this isn't something that can come out of the arts community because you're not going to know where they came from. But it's something that, again, these collaborations with talk to me uh, can create in this case, a platform of change, which when we go to Homeland Security and the State Department and say, we need to fix these things for the artists, they yawn first and kind of wander away. But then when we can say, well, there's this inefficiency and this inefficiency and this one, and we can fix these. We don't need Congress to do it, which is good. Uh, we can do this administratively. And again, through these kinds of coalitions, uh, the advocacy that we're working on is actually starting to show some positive effects. And I think the same could be said for the work yeah, I think uh, Pan America, as you, as you um, all know, um, lies in the intersection of literature and, and freedom of expression. Um, so Pan really seeks to activate the publishing world and, uh, and, uh, and the writers when are we try to do uh, the same activation with the art world, which is not as, as easy as it could perhaps be seen. Um, one of the things that immediately I got into, I would say, um, the weed, I think we did that, you know, I'm sorry, my English is not that well to do it, um, is um, the immigration path. And I think we've met immediately in January, so it was January 27 last year, um, we got a number of artists stuck on the border, uh, exhibition couldn't happen, so um, we wrote an open letter, we had an open letter, um, with writers and artists sign on, um, we filed um, an, amicus, an amicus, um, uh, last September to uh, really with other organizations that NCAC and, and many other to really kind of challenge the system within the system and um, there are a lot to do. We are, um, I think as, as I'm speaking, uh, releasing a statement about um, uh, the books uh, ban in, in, in prison. We did a statement about the quantum awards. Um, there's like, it's, it's a kind of a nonsense world where we are living. Um, how we, we kind of protest, we, we kind of challenge the system also in the international level. I think it's, it's worthwhile another thing that 
the artist wants to create a community of artists, you are a community, you are being supportive of other artists who have been in danger, you have to continue, they need your support, they need to know that you are with them. Um, one of the things we are, we are creating is a toolkit for artists at risk, you know, to explain them how to navigate the threat, how to build a safety net. And also, of course, uh, even it, it may think like a bit naive, I strongly believe still in international organization. And I think the only way to make a very uh, big change on the ground with the policy makers is to make sure that the UN, UNESCO, all those mechanisms, they know that, they know that artistic freedom, they know that we are um, there and loud and we can move uh, borders, we can move barriers, we can build, you know, uh, broke walls, that's, that's our, our challenge. Um, I think in the interest of time, I was going to talk a bit about some of the uh, activist protesting events that we've been involved with and you've been involved with. I think there's been a lot talked about today and some amazing projects that are, that are voicing dissent and I don't think I need to really talk about that anymore. I'm going to skip mine. I don't know if skip your, your, your I will yeah, just one say one, one, one event that I really want um, you to, you know, after I, I sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, it's the Art Action Day, so I don't know if you're aware of the WE, the Federation, which is a, a group uh, formed by uh, Laurie Anderson and many other artists to uh, really respond to what happened last year after the election. Uh, one of the things, um, I, I don't know if you remember, uh, the art world and the art community have been, you know, kind of has to close the door uh, right after uh, inauguration. And I think it was a terrible idea and, and, and a lot of people uh, had, the, had the same thought. And so this Saturday, Sunday, uh, all over the city, uh, look at the WE uh, Federation uh, website. There are events all over the, 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 the city and all over the country too, uh, to show that our dyna dynamism, our energy, our, our protests, uh, we are doing uh, reading at, uh, in front of the, of the library, uh, the public library on 42. So uh, please come to join us at 5.30 and we'll have an amazing lineup of readers to read protest, protest words. Um, again, sprint through all of this. Um, a lot of amazing ideas, a lot of really inspiring interviews have been coming up. I'd like to invite Brent back to the stage uh, to talk a little bit about the, the question of what happens next. Um, then the long-awaited for open discussion will happen where you can actually start talking again. So that'll be, it's only moments of that. Um, again, thank you all for coming. Thank you for Matthew also for preparing so well for the uh, conference and uh, the Groups that just spoke will have uh, breakout sessions in the uh, Siegel where we have lunch soon. I still would like to acknowledge also Roberto Levitov, with whom we collaborated earlier before for Peter was our border. We miss you, Roberto. And uh, in the uh, spirit of uh, Ty Jones, who was with us, I would like to say and acknowledge the Nenapi people of Congo's land who are gathered today and we pay respect and, uh, to the Lenape people and ancestors' past, present, and futures. Um, again, uh, my name is Frank, I'm from the Studio Theatre Center, and the director on this day is really very, very important to us. It is an important moment uh, uh, we all experience, and the big question is, then what do we do? We do live in very dangerous times. All of us who are in the theatre will have to do something, and we have to do that now. Everyone, all of us here in the room and outside, we have to do our civic duty. Uh, next generation will ask us, what do you do? What did you do? Or why didn't you do that? And I'm from Germany, and I think you know uh, that I'm somehow an idea what I'm talking about with this, so really, it is a moment. 
The film and fashion industry, journalists and sport communities are already speaking out loudly. But what should we, the theater people, do? And really, what would work? And what would make a real difference? All of us in the theater, I feel, already do more than a fair share to speak the truth, fight for social justice, for fairness, and for less suffering in the world. It often feels that our voices are drowned and dwarfed by cable, TV, internet, and Twitter. Today we heard so many great uh, 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 encouraging voices, especially from around the world, and this is also why I think it's a great idea of Theater Without Borders to look at voices from around the world that we learn from them, and not just uh, try to teach people, help them to develop their work. It's actually a time where we have to look what works, what have people done, and uh, also in this country, as I said, for hundreds of years, and now we need to learn. They are great examples, and really, I think we do have uh, to act. If one day we are on trial, Heiner uh, Bolovan said that uh, uh, we can say we tried something and we can plead not guilty. But we really, really, really have to try something and do that in a serious way. Theater is changing, and it was Bertolt Brecht who said that new times need new forms of theater. In Greek theaters, the tragedy suggested that the gods have our lives in their hands and that fate is determined and cannot be changed. Shakespeare and playwrights of the Enlightenment showed that as humans, that we can and should think and act for ourselves, that we can defy gods and kings, and that humans can take face in their hands. Writers like Brecht believed that showing audiences epic stories, plays, and uh, ideas um, on, on, with realism on stage could help to change the minds of the audience. So finally, uh, people act as enlightened citizens of the world. Yeah, but until now, perhaps this is a shift, and I think this is something what we can do. Perhaps now, uh, until now, theater was in the hand of the experts. The uh, New York Avant Garde, here in this very town, maybe were the very, very first uh, to point out that perhaps there is no more center, or shouldn't there be no more center. There's a freedom of movement and a liberation from authoritative voices, the great uh, New York art movements of the Judson Church and People like John Cage believe that everyone is and can be an artist. And now I think we do live in a time um, where theater artists have to step, take a step back and Saviana, I think, also uh, mentioned that uh, today. Perhaps artists should no longer be as masters <coughs> in control. Theater artists, I think, and we think at the Seagull, should be creators of experiences, atmospheres, and encounters in a socially engaged art. And it is time that we also socially engage in politics again. It's time for theater, I think, to engage again in politics and to take a stand, and it's time to make sense and help the people who understand the world we live in and meaning, so we know where we come from, where we are, and where we are going to. Companies like Romani Protocol actually put audiences in the very, very center of their work. Something new that comes up in the history of theater, and I think it's something reflects the time and uh, something new and something important. It is no longer the total mission of the actor, the playwright, or the director, as normally, and the audiences are passive spectators. And the same should be, and that's why theatre has always reflected society and change. Each. Like we should not be passive as audience members, we should also know and we should put audience members in the center of this and encourage them to participate. You do ask, you know, what does it have to do to, uh, with us? How can we do that? It all sounds uh, like uh, uh, good ideas, but uh, how can that form of theater help to change the country? So here are some, some thoughts uh, from the Siegel Center where we think that could work. And we really do need to ask audiences to no longer just consume, but to be participation, participatory and to participate in the democracy. This is part of their civil uh, duty, but we in this theater in the way we produce work and present work, and what we do have to reflect that new model. So we have, I feel, also uh, to change. We have maybe have to become more cultural producers. Uh, we suggest, perhaps, as a very practical uh, suggestion, to join movements like in France, where every week, on every Thursday, between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m., people meet in public spaces. People bring their own drinks and food, and they talk with friends and strangers. They listen to music. And this is something very simple, but it is very, very powerful. And we could declare that gatherings as performances. And they need, to, of course, to be investigated. However small they are, 
It is something where people talk uh, to each other. And people actually decide what they want to talk about. And it's not the artist who told them um, what to do. I do think this would make a real difference. And we have seen it, uh, the uh, Occupy movement, what happened when people get together. I don't uh, advocate, advocate for that. But I think in places like this, the Central Park, the Bryan Park, and the Sukkoti Park, we should get together and talk and invite people. But how can we do that? It should not be just in New York. I think it should be a national movement. It should be everywhere in every town and every state. And again, Rimini Protocol invented something ingenious, I think, as leader artists. They created a project called 100%, and they asked 100 people by race, gender, ethnicity, to represent the town they live in, so people actually see who lives in the town. And they only they cast the very first participant. And they asked the first person to get the second person, the second person, the third, and so on, and so on. It was a chain casting. And it was not in control of someone, but it's something that went on its own, and I think, um, we could do that too, and I think right here uh, in this room, or people who look the live streams, we could get one representative from each state, they could find one representative from each city, in each city they could find someone in a borough and someone in the neighborhood, and they say, yeah, let's get, to get together and every Thursday we start and have uh, talks in public spaces that belong to us, or the people, as the, it is by the people and for the people of this, uh, this country. So, it is a form of public theater, very simple theater, and it's not something we're trained for, and we didn't do any training in our theater schools, but I think we have perhaps to get back to basics. And as we saw in one of the videos earlier the, in Africa, I think it was where they sit together in the circle and perform in front of each other on the lawn. Maybe it is something we have to do again to restart uh, <coughs> our, um, our, uh, our influence. Um, I think there should be then coming out of this cultural project in all neighborhoods. And these cultural producers, if we identify people or people join, they can produce events in public spaces, in parks, in living rooms, in parking lots or wherever. There could be screenings, readings, play readings, performances, followed by a discussion, done by these cultural uh, producers. Themes could be diversity, uh, climate change, social justice, freedom to write, immigration, sexual harassment, and so on, and a group of people may be us here in the room, or leaders without borders, or changing, could give out for each month or week um, a suggestion what should be uh, uh, done. And many existing local movements could find, I think, uh, uh, a place and a voice under this national umbrella and can also be inspired. And as La Mama said, maybe culture, they could be live streamed and people could see what someone does in the same time zone or before or later and, uh, and participate. It doesn't cost anything, it's, I think, uh, but I think it is one of the things that could really um, make a difference. The third thing is really, it sounds also simple, but it is getting out the vote. I think these cultural producers are people to encourage <coughs> audiences to vote and ask everyone, bring one more person uh, to vote. Someone who doesn't vote or doesn't really care. We learned the hard way. Uh, uh, what happened right now is, after all, about voter participation. I think we have to work as theater artists, perhaps a little bit less, as Saviana said, about our plays and our lightings and our play structures and experience things, but we, I think it's a time where we have to think about this, so I think to really say, if some, such meetings happen, vote, and get one more person, and it's simple, simple, simple numbers. If uh, everybody will find one more person to vote, um, no uh, uh, spin room uh, in the, in the, on Fox News, even the Koch brothers' money will not match that, because it's something real, and it's participation. And we as the theater community perhaps are the only community that could make something like this happen believably and that it's unorganized in a ground level in a way that is not with an authoritative voice or someone who has perhaps his own, his or own, her own agenda behind. And everybody who cannot vote like me, a foreigner, I'm a German, or an illegal immigrant or someone who went to prison and did the time and cannot vote, these people, we say, find someone who votes for you. Mm -hmm. And I think this will be a very big contribution. It's a very simple one. And people say, I have no idea what I should do. I'm overwhelmed. Say, get one person. You vote and get one more person to vote uh, for you. But I feel very strongly, we, as theater artists of a new millennium, we have to, dis to create such a public discourse first, in public spaces, in parks, parking lots, and in the living rooms. We have to see people not just as voters or someone to talk to people, we have to see them as, uh, uh, as emancipated spectators, not, not um, passive audiences. 
And I think that will help our understanding that also they might be active participants in what we call democracy. And nothing else does work. We have known that in the history uh, of time, dictatorships, uh, monarchies, uh, or military rules are devastating. And the only thing that does work, imagining as it is democracy, and we have to fight for it. Uh, to our surprise, as a pen uh, friend said, but we, we really, really have to. Lastly, we would like to suggest um, a demonstration on Mother's Day in every city in uh, New York, in America. Maybe we could start in New York. Perhaps the women who created the march in Washington could come and help us to organize it. I do not know how to do it here in the city, but I do know people would come and join. And I would like to ask uh, Peter Schumann from the Bread and Puppet Theater to create a manual online how to create the statue of liberty as a large puppet, and we watch behind it with books and rooms to clean up and to learn and to show that we are here, the streets belong to us, and it's time for a change. And that vision of the statue of liberty, a woman, an immigrant, poem that comes with it, is the mythical image that should not be given up, even though it has been called for by, I think, the Trump administration to uh, remove it. We want to take that poem serious. Um, and anybody who participates in these demonstrations, in case we get the dummy, can say, please do vote, get one more person to vote, and this is a change that they can do. We do live, I think, in very dangerous times, and the last time so many people were on the streets when a president got elected was when Abraham Lincoln um, was elected, and like in his days, uh, America was uh, drifting apart, and he did not accept a divided country. He asked volunteers uh, to fight. And these, I think, Lincoln's words, he said, um, I appeal to all local citizens for favor and to favor, facilitate and to aid efforts to maintain the honor, the integrity, and the existence of our national union and the perpetuity of popular government and to redress wrongs already long enough endured. Hundreds of thousands of people, as we all know, left their jobs, their day jobs, and signed up to fight uh, for a just and united America. I mean, we are not Abraham Lincoln and we are not in a civil war. We are not asking you to give up our artists the day jobs or others and, f and join a violent uh, fight. On the contrary, I think we theater people, we are on the side of life and peace. But in the moment I feel this country, <coughs> we all do, we got the sense today, it is a moment of clear and present danger. And I believe we could sign up a large a network and perhaps we could uh, uh, start here in New York to see if the idea works. And this meeting, as someone pointed out, is one of those. It's a gathering in the public space where we just exchange ideas. So um, to create public discourse in public spaces, public programs in neighborhoods, in every little town across America, to organize a march and demonstration on Mother's Day, that could be some things we could do or other ideas and um, it might not work. Out, but uh, again, if we are on trial one day, in the sense of Kafka, we can say we are not guilty. Mm -hmm. We tried something and we did it uh, seriously. And we didn't have to put our lives on the line as uh, people did when Evan Lincoln uh, called uh, for them to, to help the country. And um, I think we all in the theater have to change our world. If what we do would be working, most probably wouldn't be in the situation. So something also, what we do, does not reach our audiences. We also have to change. We are in new times, and we need new times. They do need new theaters, and everything else can exist parallel. Like black and museums, where we have parts of centuries next to each other. But we now have to perhaps really recently do something, something new, and I would like you all to join us or talk to talk to us if they are funders who think that's a good idea, let us know. I really do think um, to uh, the time and um, to act uh, is now. And in case this might help also to to change election, I hope also politicians will look at the role art plays. And if we don't do it, who else will really do that? It's a real question. Who else is out there who has the time, the interest, and also the love for the country, for the art, for the ideas of? of the enlightenment and the liberty. I think it is artists, have always been artists over centuries, and I think um, that's why I think this meeting is so important. We have to find a way to um, do something. Thank you all.
Okay, now you get to talk. Tracy, Irwin, Emily, are you here? Yes. Okay. Is that all? Yeah, it's, you have to make sure the light's on. Okay. So we now have some time, and uh, Matthew, you'll keep uh, me on track of when we need to, to end. Yes, Matthew? You're here. Okay, and um, we're running a little behind, but I'm hoping we can make, stay as long as we can to have this conversation, because to me this is the most important part of the day. As soon as we finish this conversation, you're going to be guided uh, to lunch, and you will be able to have more um, community conversations amongst you at different tables. So what I want to do is just briefly reflect on what we've heard today. We've heard a lot. So I'm going to just remember the first section and then ask you to just shout out reflections about it. But um, because of HowlRound and live streaming, we need to run mics to you. So anything that you have to say about this section, just so we remember it. We had the Artists Rise Up movement in New York and LA, Isa Niafago from Cameroon, Diana Milosevic from Serbia. Um, we had Yes Theater, we had Katie Rubin from Theater of the Oppressed New York. We had um, Arts Rights, uh, we had Jana Sanskriti, Arts Rights Justice, Combatants for Peace, Jonathan Meth and his uh, at the fence, Iman Aoun from Ashtar Theater in Gaza, Megan Gomez from the Working Classroom, Mia from La Mama, and Derek Goldman from the Lab for Global Performance and Politics. So just that, from that section where we were tossing uh, videos up and having these very uh, brief and intense uh, presentations, does anybody have any reflections or thoughts or reactions to that? Um, to that. I mean, what I'm going to do is go through each section, have some reflections, and then open it up to a general conversation with, with a question to you. But I just want to kind of stir our memories of, yes, can, can, you, um, can you just speak in the way? Could we not be so directed and just have people speak and ask what they, what's on their minds? It's a little too much talking from the front. Okay, I just wanted to... Um, to see if to shape the uh, the conversation in terms of remembering what we talked about. So, if people would rather not do that, then I'm going to just um, remember, remind us, because we've had so much, and that was my uh, my impulse was just to hear things from people about that. We then had the artist conversation and the presentations on diversity, climate, and arts rights. Mobility, and then I was also asked to direct a conversation. I don't mean to be um, woman explaining, but I was asked to direct this in a, to a focus conversation. So the conversation, then, if we don't want to reflect on those um, specific uh, sections, then let's really look at what Frank said too. You can talk about whatever you want, but one of those these questions that we really want to look at is what now? What are you doing? What are you thinking? What do you want to do? So we have someone in the back there. Hi, I'm Annie Hamburger from On Guard Arts, and uh, <laughs> Jessica and I were on the streets in the 70s with Anne Bogart. I've known her a very long time, being performance artists outside. It's amazing how things come around. But um, uh, I produced a show called Base Track Live about the impact of war on the military and their families. We went to 40 cities around the country. I think there's like the Martin Luther King point of view and there's the Malcolm X point of view. I'm somebody who believes in bringing people together to encourage different uh, philosophies and points of view to really look at the humanity that binds us all. We're now going to Fort Hood military base in Killeen, Texas with this show. And all of the good nature um, 
is so wonderful, but I think theater is not even on the radar of so many people. And um, the veteran who was at, who's at the center of the show, when he came and see the, saw the show, he said, I didn't even know what you were talking about. I thought you were making a film. And so I think that there's another even larger conversation, which is that before we can even encourage people to listen to us, theater is in, in the consciousness of so many people, especially in other parts of the country and the world. So February, I mean, January 29th, we're going to Fort Hood and Colleen, Texas, to literally perform for the military, um, because it's about the fact that the military can't reach active duty servicemen and women who are suffering from PTSD and then blow their brains out. And so they're looking to the arts to affect change, which could affect all of us as they're going to do six months of research before these performances and after these performances to judge the efficacy of the arts for social change. Um, and that could really affect us all. So I'm all for taking buses, taking cars, and getting out there to really um, be up front and in the same room with people who don't already agree with us. Thank you, Annie, and Annie's been a, a great uh, producer of site-specific theater, so this is taking site-specific theater to the next level, so thank you for doing that. Anyone else want to share what your big-ass idea is, or anything else that you want to say? Well, I don't know if it's a big-ass idea, but <laughs> so I'll share it. My name is Mara Sanchez, and I've, I've worked both in corporate, and I'm an artist, and I, I write, and I do any kind of thing that I, that I can. Uh, a lot of it has been in activism, but there's a resource that I was thinking about, and that is that corporate America has a hell of a lot of money. And uh, I've sort of wormed my way in there to teach uh, theater as communication, you know, uh, getting the executives to talk real talk instead of this corporate ease crap that's going on. Uh, and the reason why I'm bringing that up is because corporations run what we see, what we buy, how we think, uh, about television and all that and all this behind the scenes censorship. So I think it's I think it's an area if we go into the HR and approach it as uh, workshops to humanize the language that goes on in, in corporations. It's a way of us going in there and also start tapping into you know them not thinking that we're so dangerous because as actors we are dangerous. We have a voice. And so there's money there to be used if we go in there with the right proposals. And I'm not saying to manipulate, but yes, manipulate. Okay, the workshops so that there's more of a human voice going on, not only in corporate America, but in the world in itself. And that would affect change into what we see and at least have a finger into those billions of dollars that are going into the brainwashing that's going into what we see and experience, not only us, but especially the young kids that are so mesmerized and ADD'd by all this uh, texting and stuff. I mean, come on, you could look around the world and see that we don't have conversations. You could be sitting right here and say, hey, how you doing? And then the next person's answering back, or you're sitting in a restaurant, there's a couple there texting each other. We have a place in the world and we have to use our voices. Okay, and the way to get in is I think we've got to get back into corporate America. There's the money. Yeah. Beautiful. That is a big ass idea in my book. Anywhere else? Anyone else want to share what you're up to and what you're doing? Yeah. I love sharing. <laughs> I'm, I'm Rob Shaw. I'm the um, actor, drama therapist, um, director of Caribbean American. Hey. Can you hear me? Hi! Okay. Caribbean American Repertory Theater director. Um, we recently were working on a project with um, actors in South Africa. And the problem we faced was, while we were able to do the show there, we couldn't fully do the show here because of the visa situation. So I'm trying to find out what kind of resources um, are being made available that, you know, globally we could tap into to say, well, look, you know, actors need to move around and to prevent the U.S. government from, you know, holding up visas. Um, I guess some of your panelists could respond to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, this is great, and I just want to say, while whoever wants to speak next is thinking about what you want to say, I think the important thing is to, re is to connect with each other. So when we go upstairs, 
uh, for lunch, please get the numbers and, and emails for the people that have spoken if you want to build on this idea of corporate um, work or, or the wonderful work that Annie was talking about or the work that, that we just heard about. Someone else have a, yes, right here, Dan. Hi. Hi, I'm Dan Friedman, uh, Artistic Director of the Castillo Theater. I just want to build on what Frank was saying and also the woman who talked about working in corporate America because I think we are at a point in, in the history of the world and the history of theater where we need to break out of the institutional constraints of the theater and bring performance more and more into daily life. And it's happening all over the world. And uh, so the kind of thing you were talking about, Frank, um, it, we, I am a co-convener of a conference that happens every two years called Performing the World, and it's happening this September. And it brings people who are using performance as a way of building community, of trying out new political and social ideas, of healing uh, from literally the last, the last time we did it in uh, 2016, there were 400 people from 32 countries and 20 states. And they were not all, they, most of them were not theater people. They were community organizers, they were medical doctors, they were therapists, they were uh, organizational consultants. People who are using performance to give people a chance to try something new and break out of the box. So I just want to invite you all to come to that and, uh, and also let you know that we're not alone in this. This kind of movement out of just doing plays to bringing performance as a, a tool for social change is, is happening all over. What, yeah, what is the date also? Can you tell us the dates of it? I can, and I have some flyers for lunch. But, uh, it's called Performing the World. And it's September 21st and 23rd. And it's here in New York. Yeah. We, we, we uh, hold the actual uh, conference at our uh, Performing Arts Center on 42nd Street between 10th and 11th. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah. Well. I just wanted to help connect uh, us to our past and uh, to get us to act and move, moving forward. This is um, the International Theater Institute. Lars Malberg was the president in 1973 when we were in the middle of the Cold War. He says, uh, isn't it therefore a cowardly and defeatist attitude in times of political tension and indeed of danger in the world to say we can't change anything now? We must wait until better times come. To me, our obvious position must be, my God, we are in danger. What can we do to reinforce our network of peaceful collaboration between creative people who want to construct and not destroy? Um, then Philip Arno from, Phil, um, from Baltimore, some of you may know him. People say not for profits like uh, theater, the trust or mutual understanding or the International Theatre Institute or any of your organizations are the soft diplomacy, but I don't agree. I think we are core diplomacy. If you can get people in a room together, they change, and that is powerful. Thanks, Ulu. That's great. And yeah, we have a shout out to so many people who aren't here with us today. We have one here, and then we have one back there as well. So maybe Tracy can give him, so first we'll go here. Yeah. Hi, Nancy Cohen, I'm a writer and filmmaker. And this is a great opportunity for me to exploit you, Frank, because I <coughs> try to exploit myself and I'm not very good at it. Every year or so I trot out an old film I made on Abby Hoffman and this year I did it again right after the election at an art gallery, a Lithuanian art gallery. And we set it up almost as if it were a, you know, a, campaign. And it was there that I launched Gentle Thursday with a sign-up list. And everybody loved the film and everybody said they were going to get involved with me, but they didn't contact me. Gentle Thursday was started by a broadcasting group when I went to college. It was a day chosen once a month where everybody would sit on the lawn. Of course, there was a lot of pot, so there was a lot of fun. <laughs> but they would talk to each other and share ideas. And when I went back to Pennsylvania, the same program had gone on for years after, maybe 20. And it's in keeping with this idea to set it up virally and internationally and globally 
so that people are there. It's like MLK Day. It's just in your head. There can be art. It can be so many things. But it needs an organization behind it. I'm not that person. It's a good idea. If you could help or anybody here could help, we'd all be grateful. Another big ass idea. So upstairs. Oh, uh, I'm Jonathan Slaff. I'm an actor when they let me and a press agent when they don't, which means I'm a press agent all the time these days. Uh, I, I love all the discussion about bringing theater into new forms and new times demand new kinds of theater. And the drift is more into ensemble creation. But if we only put our energies into that, we will abandon a big chunk of theater that's more traditional storytelling. Nevertheless, we have a creative problem because topics like sustainability and, inter and interconnectedness are very difficult to put in a play. So I want to appeal to everybody. Let's give our attention to having, elevating the art of playwriting through whatever we can do, you know, in our, in our uh, training programs, in our festivals, help people approach these difficult topics with the conventional play. And, and it, you know, I was making notes here and I thought, oh, you know, I have a client that does festivals and they could set up a festival about, a, like, let's all write one acts about, in, about sustainability and we can see what comes out. I mean, of course we have to fish for the techniques, but we should start fishing in that direction. Yeah, it's great, and, and Climate Change Theater Action did that. We have one right there, Trace, one right behind you. And I think that um, also, again, upstairs is a great place to make these connections to build these ongoing uh, actions. Um, I also, I just want to quickly give thanks to Caridad Svitch, who's not here today, but I think sort of uh, was one of the pioneers of the idea of theater action, which is a the uh, uh, theatrical production that also accompanies a political action. And she's done some wonderful things, called, including After Orlando and some various uh, works that are specific to action. So I think that's, um, that's a really great idea. So back there and then, and then right here. Yeah, so here and there. Hi, my name is Neha, and I like everything about this event. I was telling the Romanian Yes, I was telling her how much I love all of the storytelling and everything, and everything you guys did was amazing, inspiring. And the uh, gentleman up there from Germany, it was very inspiring that we can tell our friends and we can discuss about ideas, new plays, and because that's, that's what makes us fall in love with it, is the storytelling. And one is so big, there are so many people, and there's so many stories to tell, and if you don't do it, who's going to do it? So just jump and do it, yeah. So thank you. Thank you for this event, thank you. Thank you so much. Over here, and then we've got um, one back there and one here. Yes, go ahead, sir. Is this working? It is. It is. My name is Dan Kench. For the last 20 years, I've been creating one-person shows on subjects of Troublemakers and How to Change the World. I'm currently touring a play called How to Stop the Empire While Keeping Your Day Job. <laughs> um, what I've been doing is taking them to fringe festivals, but I think people here who are activists who consider themselves playwrights should seriously consider writing one-person shows that can be done in a church basement. And if you need help with that, I'm easy to find on the web. Thank you. So we have someone right here. Emily, can you give? And then we have one right back there. Can you raise your hand? Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Arlene Geiger. I'm the coordinator of the Upper West Side Move On Indivisible Action Group. And we've been doing a lot of, a lot of actions, <laughs> not, not demonstrations. That, that too, but that's not the most important thing. It's really you know going out, doing canvassing, phone calling, letter writing, and so the, the reason I, I the reason I took the microphone again is um, street theater. In the past, I I've engaged in, in a number of different street theater productions, and I think we really need to bring that back, and we need to do it in a way 
where we go to the purple districts um, and we don't disrupt and antagonize, but we explore everyone's take on particular topics. And we do it in a loving way and using you know, puppets or street theater, bold, the kind of stuff that street theater you know, utilizes. But I, I, I think we have to get out and do that, not just do productions where we're all talking to the same people and getting them all more riled up because right now that's the last thing we need. Thank you, and back there, yes. I have no affiliation with the theater besides being a pretty faithful audience member as I am oh, here today. Yay! yay. <laughs> uh, big ass idea, pressure Norway to issue dual citizenships to DACA and to Haitians and to El Salvadorians. Um, you can do this with your international groups. I think you could do it in all kinds of ways. Let them include where we don't. Awesome. Wonderful. Um, okay, we've got 10 minutes left. Huh? Pardon me? Yes. Hello. Um, I'm very happy that I, I found time to come here. Um, it's wonderful listening to everybody, listening to the director of the Siegel Center. That's very inspiring. My name is Alicia Kaplan. I'm the founder and producing artistic director of Danisarte. We had been doing for the past 20 years playwriting and productions and theatrical festivals in East Harlem. I am also um, honored to have been in the productions of the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater, which did street theater um, under Miriam Colón Valle. May she rest in peace. It's a wonderful experience to be going to the community, and in this case, we went to the poor communities who opened their arms. I think it would be wonderful to bring that back. Um, Miriam is no longer with us. The Puerto Rican Traveling Theater has gotten together with Pregones. They have a different thing they're doing. And I look forward to lunch, not just for eating, but <laughs> But to be able to coordinate, to see if I can find people that we could work with, because Danisarte is right now on hiatus because we weren't able to achieve any funding to continue with our programs. But thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have someone down here. Hi, I'm Claire Partridge, and I'm a junior in high school, so it's a little intimidating to be talking in front of you all. Um, but. I have, I started taking theater in school last year, and I really enjoyed, I love improv, and I would say one thing that kind of got me into it was in ninth grade, um, in an English class, we had to, we had an assignment where we were working in groups of four, and we were taking a news article and making a play out of it. And I really loved that um, activity, and kind of my dream is to have theater be introduced into more schools like elementary, middle, high school, and I would just love to see that and get kids involved and like uh, knock into their creativity and just, um, I think it would really be awesome to see that growing over schools. I feel really fortunate to have a theater program in my school. I know it's, uh, it's really nice and like not every school has it, but I would love to see more schools getting it and even just in, like uh, put into the regular curriculum like how I did the project in my English class. It would just be great to see. Let's please keep theater in the schools. Yes, that's not a big ass idea, that's part of life. And Matthew. Yeah, in regards to taking it to the streets and in regards to breaking out of the institutions of theater, I, I would encourage people, I know that this is happening a lot, but certainly, to a certain extent, the internet is the streets. Um, if you're a theater company and you don't have a YouTube channel, if you're not thinking about podcasts, um, you're not reaching a lot of people that are out there. Um, certainly anybody under the age of 25, um, and, and there's an enormous amount of potential to that. Um, also, don't be afraid to cross into other fields. 
uh, a lot more people go to clubs and go to go to dance clubs and rock concerts than they go to theater, and you can infiltrate that. There's a lot. Of, a lot can be done with comedy that can go at you know Brooklyn Bowl or it can go at you know you can you can reach really big audiences that way, and that's another way to sort of fifth column this. So it's just a thought. Okay, we have just time for a couple. We have one there and one there. I'm, and then you, I promise that when we go upstairs and we're going to have Erwin uh, lead you upstairs, we're going to have time for a lot more discussion and soup. Hi, my name is um, Eliana. This is you talking about crossing different fields. I'm a music composition and audio engineering student. Interested in going into film score and audio post production, but I also have an interest in theater. And all this has made me think about how we can bring resistance not only to um, plays and that side of theater, but also the musical aspect of theater and combine um, music that resists certain things within our society with plays that resist certain things in our society. So I just wanted to throw that out there, but it's made me think today. Thank you. Thank you. And back there? Yeah. Yes. Is this on? Yes, it is. <laughs> Hi there. Um, my name is Ingrid. I'm a French actor. Um, I moved here three years ago. Um, and um, in the wake of you know the, the recent election, um, I got really inspired to just um, reach out to uh, the community of actors that I'm usually around, which is immigrant actors. Um, and then Meryl Streep, uh, Golden Globe speech happened, and she had that phrase that really resonated with me, which was, you know, what is Hollywood anyway? Just a bunch of people from different places. And it actually became the motto of my podcast, which is called Actsiders, where I interview immigrant actors based in New York, uh, international actors coming from all over the globe, um, Egypt, Ukraine, Lebanon, uh, Italy, Japan, um, people who have incredible storytelling as well to share with you know the world, um, stories about dedication, struggle, determination, dreams, hopes, what America represents for them, um, and why they decided to come here, you know, in spite of everything, visa and other things. Um, and so my thing now is to move this to a bigger platform. I've been looking for more funding. The response has been incredible. You know, I'm doing this on my own, but people have been reaching out. It's been incredibly rewarding on a personal human level. Um, and now I'd like to move on to international um, directors, young uh, immigrant directors. So, if any. Well, thank you so much. I've actually heard your podcast. It's fabulous, and we'll talk more about this upstairs. I'd actually like to invite Martha Redbone back up here to kind of close us out. And as she's coming up, uh, we're gonna we're gonna sing together a little bit, um, and then Erwin's gonna help us to transition to the next phase, which is lunch, which will have no leadership. So. You won't be talked at anymore. But I just wanted to acknowledge um, my my colleagues, Matthew, 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 <laughs> Frank. Um, I wanted to acknowledge uh, this team. Um, Roberta and Frank had this conversation about about doing this, and Roberta sent the word out to everyone. And Frank, I mean Matthew, and David and I said, Yeah, we'll do it. And so we've been working very, very hard to, to um, inviting all these wonderful people. And I'm really uh, so, so grateful that, that it happened and that you're all here. So thank you so much for, um, for making this big ass idea a reality. So we're gonna sing and we're gonna share our cheat sheets. We're gonna sing a song that um, was written by Dr. Bernice Johnson Reagan. And so we all are going to sing this chorus together. Okay, so you can repeat after me and then um, go through like a practice run. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. The second line goes, 
We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Okay, so now we're going to put it all together. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. That's your part, okay? So now we're going to have a rhythm, right? Believe it, we believe in freedom. 
have to hand over to Erwin, who's going to lead you upstairs and explain lunch. I'm sorry, it's across the lobby. You guys are desperate for lunch and to talk to each other, uh, so there's a way to do that. I